meeting of the Environment and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present this morning to turn off your mobile phone or at least put it on silent? And as meeting papers are uh, given to members in digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. No apologies have been received and uh, as our previous convener stood down last week, I'll chair the meeting until a new convener has been appointed. Um, Jenny Gilruth and our former convener Bob Doris have left the committee to pursue new roles and I'm sure the committee will want to join me in thanking Jenny and Bob for all their hard work in what has been a very busy period for our committee. So we wish them well in their new roles. And with their departures, we welcome James Dornan and Annabel Ewing to the committee. For this first item, James Dornan and Annabel Ewing will be invited to declare any interest relevant to the remit of the committee. Can I invite James Dornan to declare any relevant interests? I have no relevant interest to declare. Thank you. And turn to Annabel Ewing to declare um, any. I, I, whether it's, it's deemed to be relevant or not, it probably would be prudent for me to, to mention that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland. I hold a current practising certificate, albeit that I'm not currently practising. Thank you, Annabel. Well, that takes us on to agenda item two. And for this item, the committee will choose a convener. The Parliament has agreed that only members of the Scottish National Party are eligible for nomination as convener of this committee. So I invite nominations for this post. I'll nominate James Dorner. Okay, we don't have to have a seconder for that. So are we all agreed that James Dorner is the convener of the committee? Agreed. agreed. So on that note, I congratulate James and welcome him to his appointment. And we're now going to swiftly swap seats. So thank you. Thanks Bear with us. Much, <laughs> Quickest flitting I've ever done. <laughs> I meant during the day, Kenny. Thanks. Okay, thank you. For this uh, agenda item three, the committee is invited to consider whether well to take consideration of its work programme at agenda item eight and its approach to the fuel poverty target definition and strategy, Scotland Bill, and private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The committee will now take evidence on the draft affirmative statutory instrument entitled The Regulation of Social Housing, Influence of Local Authorities, Scotland Regulation 2018. And I welcome to the meeting Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, Yvonne Gavin, Housing Service Policy Unit, and Kirsten Simino Lefebvre, Solicitor, Scottish Government. I hope I got that right. This instrument is laid under the affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve the instrument before the provisions can come into force. Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited at the next agenda item to consider a motion to approve the instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has reported on this instrument and did not draw it to the Parliament's attention on any of its, opening, of its reporting grounds. I invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning. Uh, convener, I'm pleased to be here today to present the Regulation of Social Housing Influence of Local Authorities Scotland Regulations, which completes the implementation of the policy in the Housing Amendment Scotland Act 2018. Uh, first of all, I'd like to convey my thanks to both this committee and to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, who have worked with the government to expedite their scrutiny of the affirmative instrument before you today. Uh, I realise that this is unusual, uh, however, your agreement to expedite this will enable the Economic St Statistics Committee of the Office for National S Statistics to take the regulations into account at its next meeting on the 19th of September, which we hope will lead to RSLs being reclassified back to the private sector very soon thereafter. Um, convener, we are all very well versed in our understanding of why the bill came about and the clear need for us to take action in order to ensure reclassification of RSLs to the private sector. It is crucial to enable our work towards delivering 50,000 new affordable homes during the lifetime of this parliament to continue. Uh, the affirmative instrument before you today is the last step in working towards securing that reclassification. 
Uh, you will recall that Section 9 of the Act enables ministers to make regulations limiting or removing the influence that local authorities may exert over RSLs through any ability they may have to appoint officers of the RSL or to exercise certain voting rights. The instrument specifies that local authorities may only nominate up to 24% of board members of an RSL and that they may not exercise control over RSLs, for example, through powers of veto over the RSL. At stage two, uh, the government brought forward an amendment to introduce a sunset clause. That is a time limit of three years of, on ministers' powers uh, to make regulations under Section 9, meaning the powers will expire three years from the time the Act received royal assent, uh, which was in July this year. Uh, we took this action, convener, to address concerns about the open-ended nature of the powers that this committee, uh, the DPLRC and UK Finance raised during their scrutiny of the bill. Uh, convener, I once again take the, the time to thank you for your agreement to expedite the committee's scrutiny of this affirmative instrument and I move the motion to approve the regulations to limit the influence of local authorities over registered social landlords. Thank you very much. Do any, any members have questions? Okay. In that case, I move on to agenda item five. For this item, the committee will formally consider motion S5M stroke 13767, calling for the committee to recommend approval of the draft registered social landlords repayment charges Scotland regulations 2018. Only the minister and members may speak in this debate, and I invite the ministers to speak to and move the motion S5M stroke. Oh. One three seven six seven. Uh, formally moved, convener. Thank you. Do the members have any contribution to make? No. Uh, uh, then I just do. The minister, do you have anything else to say? No, convener. Thank you very much. The question is that motion one three seven six seven. The name of the minister for local government, housing, and planning be approved. Are we all agreed? Please. Thank you. The committee will report on the outcome of of this instrument shortly. Uh, and I suspend the meeting to allow a change of witnesses as there going to be one here. I move on to agenda item six, the Planning Scotland Bill. This is day one of stage two of the Planning Bill. And I welcome again the Minister for Local Government and Housing, Kevin Stewart, and his accompanying officials to today's meeting. A number of MSPs who are not committee members but have lodged amendments to the bill will also be in attendance today and are very welcome. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, so, to start off, I call Amendment 115 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 115A, 5 and 103. Minister. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm glad to see that there is a degree of consensus on the purpose of planning. 
Having considered the evidence given at stage one, I agree that having a clear purpose could strengthen the reputation of planning and help it to be properly valued for the contribution it makes to delivering better long-term outcomes for our communities, our economy and our environment. Uh, we are all agreed that the overarching purpose is to manage the development and use of land in the long-term public interest. Amendment 115 in my name uh, would this insert this into the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 1997 and apply it to functions relating to the national planning framework and local development plans covered by Part 1A and Part 2 of the 1997 Act respectively. Uh, this is in contrast to the amendments lodged by Monica Lennon and Graham Simpson, each of which stand alone in the bill and apply to the whole planning system. I believe it is better to focus on development plans as they are the basis for decision making. If the purpose was to apply to all functions of planning, it could undermine the primacy of the development plan and generate new grounds to cha challenge any planning decision. Um, I would remind the committee of the comments that Norman MacLeod of our legal directorate made during my stage one evidence session uh, on that matter. It would not be helpful to introduce a purpose which adds further bureaucracy to the system. For example, do we really want to see every decision, even for an advertising sign or house extension, accompanied by a possibly lengthy explanation of how it is in the long-term public interest. I would suggest that this would be disproportionate. In terms of defining what is in the long-term public interest, uh, Amendment 115 mentions in particular contributing to sustainable development and achieving the national outcomes. I recognise that stakeholders in giving evidence to the committee uh, have emphasised the importance of sustainable development. There is already a duty for development plans to contribute to sustainable development, and the amendment has built this into the purpose. Linked with this, new section 1A3 uh, repeals section 3D and 3E of the 1997 Act, as they are superseded by their inclusion in the new section 3ZA. Uh, the purpose has also been specifically linked with the national outcomes under the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015. The national outcomes essentially express all that the public sector aims to achieve in all areas of our lives, and they include the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the fulfilment of human rights. Under the Community Empowerment Act, all Scottish public bodies are required to have regard to the national outcomes in carrying out their functions. Therefore, including it in the purpose of planning uh, will help to ensure it is both comprehensive and consistent with wider frameworks. Amendment 115A uh, from Mr Whiteman would add specific sustainable development commitments to the proposed new Section 3ZA, creating two different objectives for planning authorities and ministers in relation to development planning. Uh, this, is, this is something that Amendment 115 has sought to avoid by the incorporation of the existing sustainable development duty from Sections 3D and 3F. Sustainable development goes to the heart of the planning system, and I have no doubt that it will continue to be a key driver for the development of the national planning framework. However, I would prefer to keep the purpose clear and succinct, rather than including a long list of documents and commitments that could change over time. Uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the Quito Declaration form part of our understanding of what sustainable development is. And as I have said, the Sustainable Development Goals are embedded in the national outcomes. I don't believe it is helpful to add these specific references in the primary legislation and expect planning authorities to address multiple different goals, which are, after all, all seeking to achieve the same thing. 
Uh, Monica Lennon's <coughs> Amendment 103 uh, would highlight health, environment, and equality and human rights uh, as aspects of the long-term public interest. As I have mentioned, the national outcomes mentioned in my own amendment reflect the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and refer to the fulfilment of human rights and cover all of these aspects in a more global way. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Um, Andy Whiteman, to move and speak to Amendment 115A and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much, um, convener. Uh, we ag agreed in the Stage 1 report that we need a purpose of planning, and I'm pleased that Minister has... We've reached a broad consensus on that, on that, on that principle. Um, however, I, I, I was clear, at least at Stage 1, um, and in dialogue with uh, those who give evidence, that a purpose of planning should be a purpose of the planning system. It should be a standalone purpose um, to give some direction and some coherence to a system that's been in place now for 70 years. The Amendment 115 doesn't uh, do that. Instead, the uh, purpose that's contained in 115 is not that of the planning system, but is one related to the purpose to be achieved by ministers and planning authorities in exercising their functions, which is a, a subtly but importantly different concept. Now, I heard the minister uh, make the point that there's the rationale for that is to restrict the application of the purpose to the development planning process rather than the system as a whole. Uh, I hear what he says about evidence that was given by one of his officials from the uh, legal directorate. However, I would say that we have a purpose of planning that's freestanding in many statutes in many other countries. Uh, witnesses uh, drew our attention to those in, in written evidence um, at stage one. And I am keen that we see a purpose of planning as a standalone uh, purpose at the head of the uh, bill, and therefore I'll be supporting Graham Simpson's amendment number uh, five. I also feel there is scope for expanding that, although I, um, I'm open to further discussions on that, and for the sake of argument, we'll be supporting Monica Lennon's 103 uh, as, as well. Um, as far as the Minister Kevin Stewart's 115 is concerned, I have a, a problem in the sense that I, I think the purpose should stand alone above it. However, I see that this is a useful section uh, which could, in my view, be reframed as exercise of functions rather than purpose uh, of planning. Um, I'm content that 3D is repealed. I'm not sure about 3E because that's a power to issue guidance, and I'm not sure that is replicated in, in 115. Um, however, as I say, I'm content to support 115 on the basis that uh, between now and stage 3 we um, have a standalone purpose and that we amend this section to be one that's about the exercise of functions in development uh, planning. Um, on my amendment in my name 115A, uh, it was put to us in evidence that the planning system in Scotland doesn't sit in isolation from the planning system across the UK, which doesn't exist in isolation from Europe or indeed uh, the world. And with the increasing global concerns around a number of areas that are well expressed in the sustainable development uh, goals, um, there is in increasingly international instruments that draw attention to the need to plan the use of land in ways that contribute to key international instruments. And uh, we, we had evidence that this would be a useful idea, and, and 115A is actually specifically targeted at ministers and planning authorities exercising their functions. It's not actually related to the purpose of planning, and that's why I've put it in as an amendment to 115 rather than as a, a freestanding one. Uh, that's all I have to say. I thank convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham, you want to speak to amendment 5 and other amendments in the group? Um, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Convener, and uh, welcome to your new role. And uh, uh, public apologies for, for, for being late. Uh, but here I am, I speak to amendment 5. Um, as uh, Andy Whiteman um, has, has already said that uh, the committee looked at this very carefully. Um, we concluded that there should be a purpose uh, for planning. That seems to have been widely accepted, and I'm glad that uh, the, the minister has uh, put something forward. Um, I've um, been on a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a journey, convener, on, on this one. Um, I, I started off uh, including uh, all kinds of things uh, in the purpose for planning. Um, so I had a couple of uh, quite quite long versions, 
Uh, and then I was persuaded that really it's better just to keep it simple. Um, and so that's, the, that's where I've ended up, keep it simple. It couldn't really be any simpler. It's only one sentence. Uh, the purpose of the planning system is to manage the development and use of land in the best long-term public interest. Um, so I think, I think that works. Um, I really don't think we need to add to that. However, um, there are other amendments that we need to consider. Um, so uh, d despite my uh, view that we, need to, we, we should keep things simple, um, I've had a good look at Kevin Stewart's amendment. Um, there's nothing in it that jars with me, so I'm uh, quite happy to uh, support that. Uh, similarly, Mr. Whiteman's um, seems to make sense, um, although we are getting we are getting very wordy here. But um, I would we'll, we'll be happy to support Mr. Whiteman's uh, as well. Uh, Monica Lennon's um, I, I, I do have uh, concerns with because I'm not really clear how we get equality and human rights into. The into the planning system, um, and for that reason alone, I'll not be supporting Monica Lennon's amendment. So uh, I'll be pressing my own and supporting the others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. And uh, Monica, you wish to speak to Amendment 103 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Um, I would begin by also welcoming the, the minister's opening remarks and. Um, would align myself with probably most of what Andy Whiteman has said. I'll, I'll return to, to Graeme Simpson's points, but I think we've had a really good um, debate um, on the planning system and the scrutiny of the bill, I think, has been excellent. And it's been clear to us that everyone who engages in planning um, needs to know why we plan in the first place. So that's why... Um, I believe that it is really important that we have a purpose for planning in the bill, and I welcome the progress and the movement that's been made by the Minister on that um, front, notwithstanding the comments of your, your legal advisor, Mr McLeod. Um, we do, I think we all agree that, that planning has to, to, to work for the best long-term public interest, but because planning has such a, a huge impact on the bill and the natural environment and already does have an impact on the health outcomes of the nation, then I think it is really important to say um, in the bill what, what planning is for, what, why we bother at all, because the consequences of bad planning are catastrophic, uh, both here in Scotland and globally. So that's why... Um, my amendment 103 um, seeks to ensure that spatial planning in Scotland is used to improve health and environmental outcomes and promote equality and human rights. And I would gently say to my colleague Graham Simpson that if we don't understand that, that planning absolutely has to you know, seek to respect people's um, human rights and protect them and to embed equality into our decisions, then we we, we, we have a planning system that doesn't really work for the vast majority of people. And I think we've heard a lot of evidence from, from communities and other organisations about why this really, really matters. So I'm pleased that for, for my amendment, um, my attempt to enshrine the right to health as a core planning objective is supported by Voluntary Health Scotland, Alcohol Focus Scotland, Nourish Scotland, Obesity Action Scotland and Samaritan Scotland um, set out in their joint statement was sent to, to members ahead of this stage to um, debate. Um, I, I, I do accept it. We have to maybe work on, on some of the language here um, around health and environmental outcomes. Uh, you know, I hear what Homes for Scotland are saying, that they, they, they think that these um, words limit the scope of planning. Um, so I'm open to um, what we could do to, to further um, stay um, economic and social outcomes, although I think that is embedded already. Um, so I'm disappointed that, that, that Graeme Simpson doesn't support um, that commitment to equalities and human rights in the planning bill. Um, we've got some work to do, but I do welcome the progress made by um, the government. Um, but I do think that, that the minister's amendment does fall short because I think we really have to um, embed you know, this, our ideals in terms of improving public health. We know that the inequality is spatially embedded into our communities, we have a big opportunity to get that right for not just for today, but for the long term. 
Thank you, Monica. No, not to this. Uh, yeah, on. Hey, thank you, Camilla. Just really to ask the minister when he is responding to the, the points raised, if he could just clarify for me, because I thought I had heard him say that sustain UN Sustainable Development Goals are actually embedded in, in national outcomes. And therefore, if that is the case, it would seem to me that any further reference uh, would be unnecessary from a drafting perspective and indeed perhaps could risk um, inadvertently uh, a confusion. Uh, so perhaps the minister could clarify that point. Winding up, Minister. Uh, any other questions for the Minister? OK, in that case, Minister, would you like to... Oh, my apologies, Andy. You'll get a chance to wind up. All right, OK. Anybody else? Right, OK. Minister, would you like to wind up? Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, to answer Ms Ewing's uh, question first, um, yes, these goals are embedded in the national outcomes. Um, putting them in primary re legislation... Uh, when we have an ever-changing feast in terms of these goals is difficult, uh, I would say, and actually takes away from the current situation where we can change things quite easily. Uh, and we would have to change primary legislation here um, in order um, to keep up with the times. So I do think that um, Mr uh, Whiteman's amendment, although I think he means it to be helpful, is actually an impediment uh, in terms of keeping up um, with uh, these ever-changing uh, situations when it comes to um, sustainable development and international um, treaty. Um, convener, what is the planning system for uh, if it's not authorities' functions under the Act? And some of that is not clear in terms of some of the other amendments, and that is why our amendment is specific. I, I don't want to reiterate again and again certain points, convener, um, but I think that in terms um, of uh, what I've said about Mr McLeod's uh, uh, comments during stage one evidence. I don't think it would be helpful uh, to introduce a purpose uh, which adds further bureaucracy to the system. Uh, and I'll give the example again and ask the question again. Do we really uh, want to see every decision, even for very simple decisions, like that advertising sign that I mentioned before, accompanied by a lengthy explanation of how it is in the long-term public interest. I do think that some of this is rather disproportionate. And therefore, convener, um, I would ask the committee to agree my amendment uh, 115 uh, and to, re to reject the amendments in the name of Mr Whiteman, uh, Mr Simpson and Ms Lennon. Thank you, Minister. And uh, Whiteman to wind up an amendment 115A and uh, inform us if you're going to press or withdraw. That. Uh, thank you. I will be pressing 115A uh, for the record. I, um, I hear the Minister about international treaties. These are not things that um, change very fast. The uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals took the best part of eight years to negotiate. Um, we've had a planning bill, I think, once every decade or so. I don't anticipate that changing. The planning system will require to be uh, reformed on a regular basis. Uh, and I don't think the fact that UN treaties uh, in themselves uh, change or might be amended as any impediment to embedding two very important international instruments um, into the planning bill to make very clear that in Scotland we recognise the validity um, of these uh, instruments. I don't agree with the Minister's characterisation that um, a standalone purpose or indeed the incorporation of the two international instruments in 115A have any bearing whatsoever on development control or app planning applications for uh, advertising signs. Um, I think in the stage one report and in the arguments that uh, I and others have made, the purpose of planning is a purpose of the system. Um, the merits of any planning application for an advertising sign or a bungalow extension rest on the local development plan and material considerations um, in relationship to the planning authority that has uh, uh, control over that. So I, 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 I remain to be persuaded of that argument. I'm happy to listen uh, further as to whether there are real legal concerns, but I'm not, I'm not persuaded uh, at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.
In that case, uh, given that you're pressing amendment, the question is that Amendment 115A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. no. And that, uh, therefore, can I ask those who are in favour of the amendment to say aye? Show of hands. Show of hands. Those against? Okay. Uh, and the uh, amendment 1158. No abstentions. Sorry? Just um, there's no abstentions. Uh, yeah, no abstentions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, agreed to by 43. Yes, yeah, so it's been agreed to by 43. Uh, Minister, it's for you to press or withdraw uh, amendment 115. I'll press 115, convener. Thank you. Uh, those in favour of amendment. <coughs> I'm going to have to get a place for you here. The, the question is that Amendment 115 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. No. no. Right, OK. It goes to a vote. Those in favour of Amendment 115, please raise your hands. Those opposed? Thank you. Uh, amendment 115 was agreed to by 6 to 1. Graeme Simpson? They call Amendment 5 in the name of Graeme Simpson, already debated with Amendment 115. Graeme, to move or not to move? To move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Therefore, those in favour of Amendment 5, please raise your hands. Uh, OK. Uh, those opposed to 115? Uh, 5, sorry. Therefore, Amendment 5 is agreed to 4 to 3. I call Amendment 103 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 115. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. In that case, the question is that Amendment 103 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Can I ask those who are in favour of Amendment 103 to raise their hands? Those opposed? Uh, amendment 103 is defeated by 5 to 2. Okay. I call Amendment 184 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with Amendment 158. Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 184 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I move Amendment um, 184. Um, the, the idea of having a, a Chief Planning Officer um, has been around in professional planning circles, uh, as I understand it, for actually quite a long time. Um, the Royal Town Planning Institute Scotland produced a, um, a think piece in March 2017, um, a statutory chief planning officer in local authorities, um, that put the case for there being one um, to mirror, in some senses, the role of a chief social worker, chief education officer, indeed, arguably a chief planner in the Scottish Minister's own planning uh, service. Um, I'm pleased that ministers accept that there is a case for having a chief planning officer. Uh, the purpose here is to elevate planning to its rightful place as a vital service within planning authorities. It's about leadership and performance. Currently, we have a heads of planning. Um, some of these are, and they're not required to be planners. Um, in some instances, they are heads of service within local government that cover other matters such as building control, cemeteries, um, and the like. A chief planning officer is about bringing and enhancing the professional standing of the planning profession within the planning uh, authorities. Importantly, it's not about creating a new statutory role with a new uh, um, salary or, or anything like that. Uh, the, the idea as put forward by ITPI, which I am uh, I've been persuaded of and which is reflected in my amendment, is to make sure that within every planning authority there is a person appointed uh, from within the uh, authority um, who is responsible for discharging the functions uh, listed in my section uh, 1A. And that will ensure that all planning authorities have someone who speaks for, very clearly and very explicitly, speaks for planning and provides uh, leadership um, on, on planning. Would uh, Mr Whiteman take an intervention? Happy to do so. Thank you. Um, 
I hear what Mr. Whiteman uh, is saying. Um, I just wonder uh, what what his view would be um, of of the following: um, that councils should be able to organise uh, themselves as they see fit. That councils, all councils, have someone who who is in charge of planning. Um, sometimes they may they may have uh, other briefs as well, but that has been their decision. Um, I just think um, that with this amendment, we're, we run the risk of telling councils how to organise themselves. Uh, uh, and quite apart from what Mr Whiteman says about not creating new roles, it might actually create new roles. Um, if you've got someone who's in charge of planning and some, something else, uh, councils may feel the need to break that up uh, and just have someone who's in charge of planning only. Um, uh, 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 and then you could you could actually create new new roles uh, and add to cost. Um, so just so, so uh, I think my basic point would be that councils should be able to run their affairs as they see fit, um, and not be ordered to by by us. I thank Mr. Simpson for his comments. I mean, local go local government and planning authorities sit within a statutory framework. Uh, there are chief social workers, uh, there are returning officers, there are chief um, education officers. There are a number of statutory roles that local uh, government fulfils, a, a myriad of them. Uh, and there are a range of uh, accountable officers, for example, that are all provided for within statute. So I don't view this as telling local authorities, or telling planning authorities rather, uh, what to do. I see this as a means of strengthening the planning system by having a clear focus for planning within the planning uh, authority. Um, and just to conclude my remarks, on the Minister's uh, amendment, which I, I, I don't think we'll be voting on for some weeks um, yet, um, I think it's too broad in its language. I'm sure the intention is similar, but I'd be interested to hear from the Minister why he chose to adopt um, a very broad uh, um, framing of his amendment um, and was not persuaded of the, the rather more kind of detailed um, amendment as advocated by RTPI. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister, would you like to speak to Amendment 158 and other amendments in the group? Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I'm convinced that there's a strong case to establish a role of a statutory planning officer. Uh, this can re-establish the role of planners as leaders uh, in the improvement, protection and development of good quality places for people, uh, a theme which has been central to our review of planning. Uh, clearly, it is for local authorities to make their own decisions about staffing and resourcing, and I agree with Mr Simpson uh, on the points that he's made. However, there is a need to raise the profile of the planning profession within authorities so that its relevance uh, to a wide range of services is better understood. My Amendment 158 requires each local authority to have a Chief Planning Officer. It sets out their role, focusing on providing planning advice to the authority, and requires authorities to be satisfied that their Chief Planning Officer has appropriate qualifications and experience. It also allows Scottish ministers to provide guidance and qualifications and experience, but, but does not oblige them to do so. Uh, the role will vary in different local authorities, so my amendment does not set out in detail the specific duties of the Chief Planning Officer. It is designed to be broad and flexible so that the post is established but planning authorities can make decisions for themselves about how it will work in their own area. I believe that that is a proportionate approach. I'm pleased that Andy Whiteman agrees this would be helpful. However, Amendment 184 in Mr Whiteman's name sets wider requirements on planning authorities and also on ministers. It goes further than is necessary uh, or appropriate, in my opinion. Uh, chief planning officers should, of course, engage in community planning, and we've already strengthened the link with the local development plan. There's no need to prescribe this as an additional duty. And Amendment 184 uh, would require ministers to prepare, consult on and adopt much more detailed guidance than that proposed in Amendment 158. 
uh, including on the outcomes to be achieved by the work of each authority's chief planning officer and on promoting awareness of the role. Um, there has been some debate um, around about centralisation during the course of this bill, and I think that 184 uh, actually would be centralising, which is something um, that I do not want to see. So I do not agree um, that this should be centrally defined, uh, and that is why my amendment is designed to allow authorities to tailor the role as they see fit. I would therefore... I I'll give way to Mr Simpson, yes. Uh, thank can I thank the Minister for taking the intervention? I just wonder if, um, if he can uh, uh, just tell us, uh, in, in terms of his own amendment, uh, what would change? I mean, we do, as I said earlier, we've got councils who, who have people who are responsible for planning but, but can also be responsible for other areas. Is his uh, amendment seeking to change that or can councils basically leave things as they are? Um, Convener, as I, I, I pointed out in what I've said before, my amendment sets out the role, um, focusing on planning advice to the authority and requires authorities to be satisfied that their chief planning officer has appropriate qualifications and experience. Um, it allows us to provide guidance and qualifications and, ex and experience, but does not oblige us to do so. Now, I think that Mr Simpson has made a point around about um, the freedom of local authorities um, to do what they need to do in these regards. Um, and I think that that is the right way forward. I think that um, if we accept Amendment 184 of Mr Whiteman's, that is too prescriptive uh, and would deny the local authorities um, freedom. So therefore, convener, um, I would ask the committee to support Amendment 158 in my name and ask Mr Whiteman to withdraw Amendment 184. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Monica, you wish to come in? Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I, I fully support Andy Whiteman's um, amendment and, and I do regret that the the Minister's amendment is, is, is rather weak. I think we have to put this into to context of what's been happening um, to local authorities and in particular to planning departments and I, and I will declare that I am a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute but we've seen I think around a 23% sort of reduction in the, in the planning workforce in the last six years or so in, in Scotland's councils and um, we know about the, the budget pressures that's well rehearsed but because I think people haven't had a clear understanding of the purpose of planning we haven't had that joined up thinking that corporate working so we've seen a diminishing workforce um, across Scotland's councils and I was just trying to pull up the the RTPI the Royal Town Planning Institute published some figures UK wide over the summer a survey of their members but for Scotland this was looking at um, is it ahead of planning in the, in the top tiers of, of government, uh, local government? And the figure for the UK uh, was that the vast majority of councils um, had planning lower down their tiers, so 83%. But that figure is 94% in, in Scotland. Um, so I don't see this about um, you know, dictating to councils what they have to do. But if we're serious about the purpose of planning and its statutory function. It has to be properly resourced. It has to have leadership. And that's why I think that Andy Whiteman's amendment is, is on the money. So I'll be supporting um, Andy's amendment. Yes, of course. Yes, just, um, thank you, Convener. Picking up briefly in the comments that have been made already, I mean, it does seem to me that um, it would be important to ensure that whilst on the one hand, which uh, Mr Stewart's amendment does, which is to require there be a chief planning officer, nonetheless, um, it, uh, it is important to afford each local authority the ability to, as the minister said, tailor um, what that role is vis-a-vis -vis their planning operations. And I think that's very important and does respect the, the role of local authorities, which I think all members want to see uh, respected. Thank you, Kabir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Andy, do you want to wind up? Uh, you. Um, we differ in degree, um, obviously. I, I don't accept the argument that this is uh, over-prescriptive or limiting planning authorities' freedom to organise things the way they 
they want to. We have one planning system in Scotland, and I think we do need a little bit more prescription about the role of the chief planning officer to ensure that uh, there's a certain minimum um, standards and responsibilities and functions being carried out by that person uh, uniformly across Scotland because we have one planning system. I'm perfectly prepared to, to accept that there might be some of the detail spelt out in 184 that is, is redundant or goes too far, and I'm happy to have that conversation. And I think between stage one, stage two and stage three, we will have that conversation because we are all agreed that there shall be uh, an amendment. Um, we're not all agreed, but I think there is broad agreement uh, um, that there shall be a chief planning uh, officer. I'm moving amendment 184. Thank you very much. That, the question is then that Amendment 184 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Okay. Can I ask those who are in favour of Amendment 184 to show their hands? And those opposed? Okay. Uh, uh, defeated by 5 to 2. We now move on to National Planning Framework. Members will see that we have a very big group of amendments in the National Planning Framework. <laughs> To facilitate debate, this group has been divided into five subgroups. Debate will be structured around these subgroups. When that is all completed, we will then move to disposing of amendments as normal. For each subgroup, I will call those who have amendments in the subgroup to speak. Members will be called in the order in which their amendments appear, as usual. There will then be the opportunity for any other member who wishes to speak on the subgroup to do so. Finally, if he has not already been called, I will give the Minister an opportunity to comment on the amendments in each subgroup. Members should not move, press or withdraw their amendments unless I indicate to them that they should do so. I draw members' attention to the information about preemptions that is under groupings. I will remind members about preemptions when we reach the amendments in question. I also point out that amendments 38 and 39 both preempt amendment 6. This information was omitted in error from the groupings document. So we move to the debate on the first subgroup on the forum and content of the National Planning Framework, and I call Amendment 185 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Uh, Alec, would you? Good morning, Camino, and good morning to the Minister and colleagues as well. Um, I appreciate I'm something of an interloper in this committee, but I would like to take this opportunity to extend my thanks to those members of the committee who have included me in discussions around the foothills of this bill um, and in explaining a lot of its contents to me as well, so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, members will remember that at stage one, my party was the only party to oppose this uh, bill at stage one, and that was principally behind, uh, because of the reasoning for my amendment for 185. Um, that, be, that is because we believe that, um, as it is worded right now, the uh, the creation, well, the, the preeminence of the national planning framework um, is here to bolster the powers of ministers. And if you read what it uh, attempts to repeal from the 1997 Town and County Planning Act in respect of um, the wording in section 3A, subsection 2, around the national planning framework, um, we delete a set of words which say that in broad terms, it's how Scottish ministers considers, consider that the development and use of land could and should occur. Uh, it deletes that wording and replaces this with a, a manifestation that this is really how ministerial policy will be put into action. In discussion with my council group leaders around the country, we could not, as Liberals in good conscience, uh, support such a movement of power to the centre. Um, I think that whilst you may argue, the minister may argue this is about phrasing and semantics, um, it actually, think, I think, sets the tone for this, to, uh, this entire uh, bill, which we think unnecessarily and disproportionately empowers ministers at the expense of planning authorities. Um, our belief is that should uh, we pass this bill unamended, that it would see councils relegated to the role of consultees. Um, and I was very grateful and gratified to hear the minister say that he did not want to see centralisation in this bill, so I hope that he and government members will support Amendment 185, which I move in my name. Um, while I have the floor convener, may I also speak to um, 116E, which I think is a, a, a very similar uh, amendment based on um, the government's proposed amendments in that section. Um, I would also like to throw my party support, although we have no vote at this stage, behind Amendments 38 and 39 in the name of Graham Simpson to better empower the Scottish Parliament um, and indeed uh, Andy Whiteman uh, 39A and 39B in respect to the same extending consultation periods for the, for the Scottish Parliament. So with that, I will end my remarks. Thank you, Alec. Uh, Graham Simpson, 
now to speak to Amendment 30 and other amendments in the subject. Yeah. Thanks, Convener. Um, I've got a few in this section, 30, 31, 1160 and 116S, so if you'll bear with me, uh, I'll try not to take too long, but I'll address um, e each of them. Uh, on Amendment 30, um, uh, we're, we're, we're saying that the National Planning Framework should define regional housing targets, um, and since this is a planning bill, the amendment focuses on targets of the use of land for housing. As there are no formally defined regions, the amendment uses the word areas uh, instead. Um, Homes for Scotland uh, have backed this amendment. Uh, in their view, uh, if the statutory development plan for an area is to comprise of two components, the NPF and the local development plan, then clarity must be provided on the respective role of each. And they say that my amendment 30 helps to uh, achieve that clarity. Um, on amendment 31, um, the national planning framework should be more fully integrated with wider government policies and strategies. And this amendment extends this obligation to include the national transport strategy, strategic tr transport projects review, land use strategy, national marine plan, infrastructure investment plan, climate change programme and the national housing strategy uh, and uh, action plan. Um, so for me, it's just about being joined up. Um, 1160, um, this, this, this is actually an, am an amendment to another amendment, which we haven't discussed yet, 116, but seeing as I've got the floor, I'll address it. Um, so again, this sets targets for the use of land uh, in, in different areas of Scotland uh, for housing. Um, we do have a housing crisis. Uh, the national planning framework, uh, we believe, should include targets for land set aside for house building. We need to increase house building. Um, and we do see um, there is a role for government in this. Um, so I, I do, uh, you know, I do hear what Alex Cole Hamilton is saying uh, on centralisation, but I think it would be remiss of any government uh, not to uh, set housing targets. Uh, again, this amendment supported by Homes for Scotland. Amendment 116S um, uh, says the national planning framework must be prepared with due regard to other relevant policies and strategies. I've, I've covered, I've actually covered that one previously, so uh, I did promise not to uh, speak uh, for too long, but if I can just uh, address 116 uh, in the name of Kevin Stewart, it does, if, if we were to accept 116, convener, um, uh, and I can let the conversation, yeah, I'll just carry on. Um, it would sweep away um, other uh, other amendments, um, which which I think are positive uh, uh, amendments. So um, uh, I would probably not be minded to support 116, but I'll be moving all the other amendments that I've spoken to. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, Graham. Uh, Monica, to speak to Amendment 104 and other amendments in the subgroup. Thank you, um, convener. Um, I've already been quite clear in my proposed purpose of, of planning that the planning system has the potential to have a, a positive impact on health outcomes across Scotland. Um, that can only be realised if we embed that idea in every stage of decision making and planning. The idea that people's health is taken into account during the development of the national planning framework and local development plans and individual development level. So this amendment would intend to ensure that the consideration of health effects of any national development is enshrined in the development of the national planning framework and then taken into account um, at that level. So I'll be moving that amendment. And if I can turn to 83A, I think we're still in the same group. Um, 83A um, seeks to amend Amendment 83 in the name of Andy Whiteman. Um, we heard from Engender at stage one um, in their written evidence to committee um, that they believed that gender equality had been inadequately um, embedded into to the to the bill to the planning process um, 
I know that we, we have ongoing discussions about uh, the relevance of equality to, to, to planning, and I don't want to, to re-rehearse all those arguments here, but I appreciate that some members still need to be convinced. I think that's why, indeed, we have to have these things um, very clearly in the bill. Um, I'll be supporting Andy Whiteman's amendment, um, 83. Um, my minor suggested changes um, would seek the addition of and equality. Um, <coughs> in addition to gender, and that's just to make it much more explicit um, that the national planning framework should be required to set out how it will promote and take account of gender equality in Scotland, rather than reporting on how the policies and proposals in the national planning framework simply relate to, to gender. I, I know that the Minister uh, committed to have further discussions within gender and other equality groups, and I'd, I'd look forward to hearing how that is going. So I'll be moving Amendment 83A. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. Uh, Kenneth Gibson to speak to the amendment. And of course, there's a One huge swathe of and other amendments in the subgroup. Thank you. Sorry, I was so excited at the possibility <laughs> of speaking to this bill. I jumped in before you there, convener. Just the, the 116A and 116B uh, are, of course, belt and braces uh, amendments, you know, if 116 is passed. But 116, 1168, uh, sorry, 167, 168, 116A, 116, 116B. Uh, our amendments to ensure the provision of housing for older and disabled people is considered the national planning framework. Amendment 167 seeks to amend section 3A3 of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act to 1997 to include a specific statement in the NPF focusing on housing priorities in relation to older people and disabled people to help meet their housing needs uh, with 116A uh, seeking to include what Scottish ministers consider to be the priorities for housing suitable for older people and disabled people. Uh, the NPF has got a strategic role to play in the development and use of land in Scotland and in the setting of national infrastructure priorities and this should include setting clear national targets for delivering older people's and disabled people's housing where it be most effective and deliver the best outcomes. Uh, amendments 116, 167 and 116A address the housing challenges arising from the demographic of Scotland's rapidly ageing population which underlines the need to invest in housing for older and disabled people. Convener, Scotland's population of older people is projected to increase significantly, with the number of people aged 65 and over uh, expected to rise by 59% to 1.5 million by 2039, uh, and many will be infirm and have disabilities. There is therefore a pressing requirement to ensure that housing needs of older people and disabled people are explicitly recognised within the planning system. Uh, housing is a key role to play in allowing older people and disabled people to live independently, healthy and active lives at home for as long as possible. An investment in housing will save resources that would otherwise be spent in health and social care, help to tackle loneliness and isolation and contribute to greater health and well-being. Amendments 167 and 116A would ensure that a strategic, coordinated national approach is taken to address the housing needs of older and disabled people and ensure planning authorities, developers, the third sector and other key agencies take a consistent approach. Without a strategic approach, there is a real risk that the housing needs of Scotland's ageing population will go unmet, with significant consequences for older people and disabled people in society as a whole. So planning policy must anticipate the long-term needs of Scotland's ageing uh, population and plan now to deliver different types, tenure and size of homes urgently required in the future. Homes specifically adapted for people living with dementia, people with mobility issues, people with disabilities and people with a sensory impairment. Amendments 168 and 116B would provide national targets in the NPF to address the housing needs of older and disabled people, including the, ad the adaption of existing and the building of new housing, setting clear targets for the provision of older people's housing will help us to pr proof uh, the provision. So, convener, the case for national targets uh, is further underlined uh, by the increase in housing needs of single older people protected, projected to rise. Uh, by 45% to almost half a million by 2039. So these amendments uh, are, are being moved in order that society can help address those issues. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Uh, uh, Rhoda Grant to speak to Amendment 211 and other amendments in the subgroup. Thank you, Convener. Um, I want to speak to my amendments 211, 212, 213, 116R, 116T and 116U. I was brought up in a small community in Wester Ross, and over the years I've watched the fortunes of that part of the region change, with population decline being a constant challenge. 
It was therefore with some horror that I read a recent report from the James Hutton Institute, commissioned by the Scottish Government, and it states that in areas like the one where I was brought up, they risk losing over a quarter of their already reduced population by 2046, and that will threaten their very existence. But this is not just a Highlands and Islands challenge, it also impacts on the southern uplands and indeed many parts of rural Scotland. So what is to be our response as a society and as a parliament? Past planning systems and land use policy have caused some of this decline and therefore we must have something to offer by way of a solution towards those challenges that we face. Our rural areas provide huge benefits for Scotland, places where people in Scotland love to visit because it's beautiful. But it's, as well as having nice countryside and wild places for people to visit, we surely want to visit living places and vibrant communities with distinct culture and traditions. It's time to give the people dimension of the countryside greater status in building future planning policy, not just to retain, but to restore um, the population. It's people that are the lifeblood of these places. The challenge is to ensure that Scotland's planning system facilitates rural repopulation and balances sustainable economic development with protection of our natural heritage. And the planning bill offers an important opportunity to make sure we focus on the real challenges of our rural areas. And these amendments seek to take this opportunity. Amendment 211 is a perhaps quite modest in scope in relation to these matters, but it's an important building block towards ensuring the planning system enables Scotland's rural places and communities to thrive and prosper. It requires Scottish ministers must have regard to the desirability of ensuring that the population of rural areas increases and that resettlement is encouraged in rural areas that have become depopulated. It asks for nothing more than ministers consider the desirability of these objectives when preparing the national planning framework. By placing such a duty on ministers on the face of the bill, it sends an important signal that rural repopulation is a matter that the parliament requires ministers to consider seriously in framing future planning policy. And it's also a signal that sustainable development of Scotland's rural places is a policy priority shared by all. Amendment 212 is designed to assist in the development of a national planning framework through the production of maps and associated materials uh, relating to no longer inhabited human settlements. And the purpose of these maps will show where Scotland's rural areas, human settlements previous, previously existed, thereby providing an indication where rural repopulation may be desirable through resettlement as expressed in local development plans and local place plans. Yes. Thank, thank Rhoda Grant for taking the intervention. Um, so when I read um, the, the, this particular amendment, um, I, I, I must admit I was slight, slightly baffled as, as, as to the intention. And um, it, it asks um, for the national planning framework to contain maps, diagrams, illustrations um, of no longer inhabited human settlement. Um, and so the first question that arose in my mind and, and others is, well, how, f how far do you want to go back? I mean, do we go back to Roman times, pre-Roman pre times? Um, you know, I just wonder what, what you're trying to achieve here, because it could create uh, an enormous amount of work, um, it, you know, if we're going back uh, as far as that. We wouldn't be going back as far as that, but I think anyone who goes into a countryside, um, and certainly the areas I cover in my region, will be very aware of villages that have been uh, been there. You can see the houses uninhabited, whole communities that have disappeared. And I would suggest we go back to some of the areas, certainly um, around the clearances that were cleared um, to make way for sheep, but certainly not much further back than that. But there are communities that were vibrant and could be vibrant again in our glens. And I think it would be important to indicate, and of course, part of this is in the plan, so you would have to consult to make sure that that was a, a desirable outcome for those communities. So I think it's important that um, local people, those people who are still there, are involved in that. And indeed, 
maybe some of the people that were in those communities previously or had families in those communities could be part of that um, consultation to make sure that those areas became part of the local plan okay. and the national plan. Is that, is that you finished? Uh, no, you can I no, no. Yeah, yeah. make a couple um, um, more comments. Um, just to, to confirm that the criteria for creating the maps and associated material um, would be developed after public consultation. So this would be consulted on and um, it's detailed in my amendment 216, which we'll come to later. Um, the maps for no longer inhabited human settlements will therefore complement Scotland's network of 42 wild land maps covering 3.7 million acres by also representing a material consideration in relation to planning decisions. The Crofton community where I was raised was, so, was surrounded by so-called wild land. However, much of it was actively crofted and um, stocked with sheep in the summer. So it may be right that we have maps of wild land, but I would have thought it could also be right that we would map our human heritage, that we understand the landscapes that we see today were once home to families and entire communities. My hope is that those places will, may once again ring to the voices of children playing within that wonderful environment, which will not in any way compromise the scenic characteristics. The maps I envisage would bring to life the understanding of not only what our landscape's history has been, but what its future might be and the future in which people and nature coexist to their mutual benefit. Amendment 213 is intended to give Scottish ministers the option when preparing the national planning framework to assess existing legislation or national strategies that could be amended to improve their impact on delivering the planning system's outcomes. In doing so, it provides an opportunity for joined up planning system with existing legislation and national strategies to produce a more cohesive policy framework and it's intended to offer flexibility and to be of assistance to ministers. If um, Amendment 116 is approved, then Amendments 116R, 116T and 116U simply repeat Amendments um, 211, 212 and 213. Um, Basically, I'm hedging my bets against <laughs> that. Um, so I'll say nothing more, um, but when the time comes, I hope to move those amendments. Thank you very much, uh, Rhoda. Uh, Andy Whiteman to speak to Amendments 83 and other amendments in the subgroup. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. This group of amendments f uh, includes 116, which of course uh, deletes and replaces the whole of Section 1. There are a lot of amendments to Section 1. Uh, which we'll be getting through, some of which I support and some of which I, I don't. Um, and, of course, we won't vote on 116 until we've dealt with all the other amendments to Section 1 and, indeed, all those amendments to Section 116. If I can start with Alex Cole Hamilton's 185, um, um, and I can assure him, I think, that the bill will be amended <laughs> by the time of, of, of Stage 3. Um, I understand, I have some sympathy with the Liberals, position on this, but I think um, their view on um, Section 3A2 of the bill is a little misplaced. I mean, we're, we're really talking about an alternative wording. I think there's broad agreement that there should be a national planning framework. Um, provision was made in 2006 for that to be the case, and there are subsequent uh, amendments being taken forward in this bill in regard to the national planning framework. So we're, we're, we're all agreed on on that, I think, and if the Liberals are, are, are not, it'd be useful to hear that they're not. So then the question is, um, what is the National Planning Framework to do? And as it exists in the 97 Act at the moment, it describes it as to be something that sets out in broad terms how the Scottish ministers consider that the development and use of land could and should occur. Now, the bill deletes those words and says that the National Planning Framework is to set out the Scottish Minister's policies and proposals for the development and use of land. I think that's a more elegant form of words. I think it more succinctly captures what the National Planning Framework is, and I'm perfectly uh, content with it. And I don't think it has some of the ulterior motives that Alex Cole Hamilton attributes um, to it. Um, I agree with uh, amendments 30, 104, 167, 31, 211, and particularly I want to draw members' attention to Monica Lennon's uh, Amendment 104, which is part of a suite of amendments um, seeking to incorporate health more centrally in the planning system. I think this is an incredibly important um, proposition. Um, I'm aware there may be some concerns around that, and I'm, I'm very, very open to having conversations about that. But it has echoes of the... Um, 
the genesis of the town country planning system in 1947, soon after the war, uh, the Scottish office, as was then, set up the Scottish Home and Health Department. Um, and it was intentional that home and health be linked because there was a wide awareness that the living conditions of the people across the United Kingdom um, were substantially suboptimal. Uh, the war had drained the country, and that in the process of reconstruction, uh, people's health uh, was a vital interest, and people's health was materially impacted upon by the environment within which they live, and therefore the environment that is substantially designed and planned for uh, by uh, people. And indeed, one of the first people to work in the Scottish Home and Health Department in advancing that remit uh, was the planner uh, Ian McHarg, who went on to become an internationally renowned planner, formed, uh, founded the School of Landscape Architecture in Pennsylvania. So I think this is a really, really important debate, especially as we talk about um, the increasing pressures on the health service and the need to ensure that people are more healthy and that therefore we reduce pressures on the national health service and create a more healthy population. So I think it's incredibly uh, important. I also, in terms of uh, Rhoda Grant's Amendment 211, which again is part of a suite of amendments, I think this is very, very interesting and we heard evidence brought forward by Community Land Scotland in this regard. I think it's quite a departure and I think it's very healthy that the planning system should begin to reflect a little bit about decisions that were made in the past, not the long past, not in Roman times, um, but in the past about the use of land prior to the introduction of the formal town country planning system in 1947. And that considerations about how land was used in 1870, 1890, 1920, 1940, 1950, 1960, um, should inform, should inform um, our view on how land should be developed in the future. And I think the amendments that Rhoda Grant's brought forward merely make sure that the information necessary to take that view is incorporated um, at the outset. Moving on to Amendment 83 in my name, this is one again of a series of amendments that crop up in different parts um, of the uh, uh, bill. Um, and that is a series of amendments to respectively the National Planning Framework, Strategic Development Plans and Local Development Plans, such that these plans, and in this instance 83 specifically, uh, the National Planning Framework, include a statement <clears throat> setting out how the plans and policies in these uh, uh, in, in the plan will take account of an impact upon gender equality. And I thank Monica Lennon for her helpful amendment 83, clarifying that this is indeed about uh, gender equality. Amendment 16, 116F replicates this. Now, academic research has shown that the design and planning of the built environment is and can be very heavily gendered with a disproportionate negative impact on women and girls. There are very good examples <clears throat> across Europe. I would highlight the example of uh, the city of Vienna uh, in Austria um, that is doing quite remarkable and interesting work uh, in this uh, area. Of course, this is evolving practice. And I think the fact that we know through academic research that the planning system is gendered and therefore that has an impact on equalities should be reflected in our laws around planning to ensure that there is a statement. And the amendment calls for no more than a statement setting out how the plans and policies in these areas will take account of uh, gender uh, equality. Uh, amendment 213, uh, I was awaiting Rhoda Grant's explanation of this. I confess I didn't really understand what it was about. Um, I'm, I'm content with 213 as long as it's very clear that it merely is an option for ministers the framework may contain. Um, I agree that the National Planning Framework, in drawing it up, will engage questions about the use of land to which other strategies and other bits of legislation have an impact. And I think it's appropriate to draw Parliament's attention and the people of Scotland's attention to the fact that we may need um, some changes in bits of legislation or amend various strategies in order to achieve the goals set out in the National Planning Framework. And I think it would be helpful to have that drawn to attention in the draft uh, framework. Turning to Amendment 116, which is a substantive amendment, um, I'll not be supporting this for two reason. reasons. Firstly, it deletes the entirety of Section 1, together with any amendments made um, 
Now, of course, that to an extent is, is, is countered by the fact that people have taken out insurance policies on that in relation to a long list of amendments to Section 116. But more substantively, Section 116 contains proposals for how the function of current strategic development planning might be taken forward in future. In other words, it's actually taking in the subject matter of Section 1 and Section 2. Um, those specific proposals subordinate strategic planning to any input to national planning. Um, we'll talk more about this when we come to uh, Section uh, 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 2 and amendments uh, to it. Um, but as I believe uh, and will argue that we should be retaining the current framework for strategic planning, I can't vote for an amendment that presumes to uh, remove uh, it. And finally, as for S Amendment 155, this is preempted by Amendment 48, forms part of a series of amendments designed to retain strategic development plans, and so I'll be voting against Amendment 155. Thank you, Andy. <coughs> uh, John Finney to speak to Amendment 160 and other amendments in the subgroup. Uh, thank you, Convener, and can I thank your clerking staff for their assistance too. Um, I, I, my colleague Andy Whiteman has spoken to others, so I'll restrict my comment to this. I have other amendments at future dates. and This particular amendment um, asked that the framework have regard to the desirability of preserving disused railway infrastructure for the purpose of ensuring its availability for future possible public transport requirements. Now, <coughs> excuse me, at the moment, the National Claiming Framework uh, which we're told is a statute for all of Scotland, um, makes reference to uh, supporting change in areas where in the past there has been a legacy of decline. It also talks about, brings together our plans and strategies in economic development, regeneration, energy, environment, climate change and transport. Um, there's also references in there to the construction of new and or upgraded railway track exceeding eight kilometres connecting existing networks to the freight handling facility. Now, unless we've secured uh, we can secure that, and therefore the desirability of the preservation of, then there's going to be challenges with the new and upgraded track. Now, excuse me, <clears throat> the second page of the, the, the framework talks about planning outcomes, and uh, I'm not going to read the entire page, but I will quickly go across the four columns that are there. Uh, the first one being planning makes Scotland a successful and sustainable place, supporting sustainable economic growth and regeneration and the creation of well-designed places. Now, if this were to take place, then it certainly meets that criteria. Next one is about low carbon, and of course there are opportunities there. The next category, uh, uh, Plan Meet Scotland's a uh, natural, uh, resilient place, helping to protect and enhance our natural and cultural assets and facilitating their sustainable use. Now, again, that would meet that. And then the final one in that particular section, Planning Meet Scotland, a connected place, supporting better transport. So. In the wider considerations, if we are genuinely wanting to see a move from road to rail for passengers and from road to rail for uh, freight, we need to maintain the infrastructure that's potentially there, and this amendment will play its part in that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Claudia Beamish to speak to amendments 214 and other amendments. Sir. Uh, thank you, convener, and, and uh, good morning to colleagues and to the minister. Um, my amendment one. Sorry, 214 requires the National Planning Framework to have regard for any infrastructure investment plan published by Scottish ministers and includes a statement uh, to include a statement setting out the ways in which the plan has taken a, into account in preparing the framework. The existing IIP sets out priorities for investment and a long term strategy for the development of public infrastructure in Scotland and is designed to be complementary to the budget. This, um, my amendment, is a probing amendment, and I would welcome a uh, comment from the Scottish Government Minister and, uh, of course, any other members of the committee. Uh, I'd like to highlight that on the 30th of July of this year, um, Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham said in a letter to the Eclair Committee, and I quote, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting the delivery of low-carbon infrastructure as a vital part of our long-term transition to a, a carbon-neutral Scotland. Our current I IP plan, published in December 2015, supports Scotland's climate change goals by making low carbon considerations one of the guiding principles upon which investments are, in, are prioritised. And uh, she, she draws to a close by saying, the current plan includes a range of long term low carbon commitments such as energy efficiency as a national infrastructure project, broadband coverage and rail electrification and future refreshes of the plan will take into account the requirements of Scotland's climate change legislation at that point in time. So my amendment um, 
uh, in, in my amendment, the IP, IIP is an important document in terms of climate change focus, but I am aware of its current scope goes beyond infrastructure. The intention behind the amendment is to give the IP, IIP statutory weight and to stress its link with the planning system. But an amendment directly doing this may restrict the document and so would require a new section setting out the form and content of the IIP and stipulations on how it is prepared, and I welcome further discussion on this. However, this amendment is drafted uh, to give the IIP some statutory weight and the statement detailing the National Performance Framework's compatibility with the IIP ensures a joined-up approach. This will bring benefits for a long-term vision, a cross-portfolio awareness, in my view, and a greater consistency in linking the low-carbon agenda with financial budgets and capital investment. And my amendment, like with others, um, 116V, has the same effect and was submitted as a contingency to the passing of Amendment 116. And, convener, with your forbearance, am I allowed to very briefly comment on other um, amendments in the group, or is that it's not in the, sub except in, in the subgroup? Yeah, thank you. So I would like to speak in support of um, Rhoda Grant's amendment, amendments uh, 211 and others uh, that she's highlighted in the group, um, and, and reinforce what she stressed about the people's dimension to rural planning. There are real challenges for rural regeneration, and this, these amendments, in my view, could contribute to, um, to that, that very important cause for rural people. They support real sustainable development, in my view, across rural Scotland, not, not just in the Highlands, but uh, in my region of South Scotland as well. And I should perhaps declare an interest in speaking about um, 83 Monica Lennon's amendment because I've just become convener of the cross-party group for men's violence against women and children. So I, th I think that should be perhaps recorded in the um, report. I want to speak in support of um, my my colleague Monica Lennon's amendment on gender equality in the planning system. In this day and age, we do need to take these things into account, and I think that the, I, the points were eloquently made by both um, Monica and also by um, Andy Whiteman, so I, I will leave it um, at that. And finally, I'd like to um, uh, speak in support of um, uh, John Finney's amendment um, having taken quite a strong interest in rail issues, and there are a number of places where those links need to be maintained very carefully, and I think to record that in recognition of both low carbon and also connectivity are very important. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, before I uh, let the Minister in to speak to Amendment 116 and others, just to say that after this subgroup, we're going to have a, a five minute break. Okay. Hey, Minister, would you like to speak to Amendment 116? And, and uh, Convener, I'm glad we're having a break after this one. <laughs> um, can, I, can I start off um, by apologising to you, Convener, and to the members of the committee for creating a monster group uh, with the addition of Amendment 16? Um, I, I, I heard Mr Simpson's fears, but very few amendments have been removed by uh, 116 that haven't been repeated as amendments to it. Um, and that reflects the, the position created by the bill as introduced, plus amendment proposed by the government, much easier um, to read. Um, in proposing further amendments to the provisions in the bill, which amend the 1997 Act, uh, we had decided that we'd reached a point where it would be clearer to rewrite the whole piece. However, I appreciate that that causes some complication in managing some of the other amendments. Um, uh, and I recognise that members have in many cases put forward parallel proposals uh, in the current version of the bill and for Amendment 116. And I'll address each pair of amendments together. Um, I'll speak to the relevant parts of Amendment 116 uh, in relation to each subgroup convener. Uh, the new Section 3A in Amendment 116 covers the form and content of the National Planning Framework, which remains largely unchanged in the Bill. It adds a requirement to include a statement of what land the Scottish Ministers consider requires to be made available for housing. 
In addition, subsection 6 ensures that Scottish ministers are not prevented from setting out policies beyond the national planning framework. Um, this is an important clarification, as it would not be reasonable to expect Parliament to approve every planning policy the Scottish Government produces. Uh, I know that we will have a, a fuller debate on strategic planning, as uh, Mr Whiteman mentioned in a later group. However, at this stage, I think it's important to explain uh, more about our thinking on this within Amendment 116, uh, as this is where we have addressed the topic. I've followed closely uh, the debate about strategic development planning in Scotland. Uh, I remain of the view that existing arrangements uh, need to be updated if strategic planning is to realise its full potential. Uh, we must be clear that fulfilling timescales and producing new plans every five years is not enough to make a real difference uh, to the p lives of people living within the four city regions. It also means very little uh, to people living in the rest of Scotland. Uh, my amendment therefore introduces a new duty for strategic planning which moves away from procedure, extends to all parts of Scotland uh, and re-establishes strategic planning as a more visionary and influential pursuit. Uh, section 3AE uh, introduces a new duty for the Scottish Ministers to have regards to strategic development reports in preparing, revising or amending the National Planning Framework. Uh, this is a significant new addition which reflects the importance the Scottish Government attaches to strategic planning and our intention to work collaboratively. Section 3AH sets out the requirement on planning authorities to produce those strategic development reports which include a spatial strategy. Uh, this would be a significant change from text-heavy lengthy plans that largely repeat national policy. The duty is also flexible. Uh, it does not set a, a fixed time scale. Um, uh, uh, it does not set that fixed time scale and there is no <coughs> prescription of the governance or administrative arrangements required um, and it does not dictate which authorities should work together. This is a significant improvement uh, on, uh, on what we have in existing uh, legislation. Uh, planning authorities can address strategic planning in a way which reflects the value it can add rather than because they have to. And the amendment also makes provision for consultation on the strategic development report. Finally, subsection eight of 3AH sets out the definition of strategic development. Strategic development may or may not extend across the administrative boundary, but will have an impact in more than one planning authority area. Uh, this will be open for planning authorities and their partners to define. Uh, I'll now turn to the amendments that relate to section 3A convener. Uh, in amendments 184 and 116E, Alex Cole Hamilton has proposed retaining the existing description of the national planning framework, which does not include Scottish planning policy. Uh, when we brought forward the bill, we explained our reasons for making a change. It could play a significant role in streamlining the planning system by removing duplication between different tiers of the statutory development plan. There was support for this throughout our cons consultation and the committee agreed that this was a sensible idea. At present, each and every local development plan includes a set of policies. Routinely, these policies simply restate the terms of the Scottish planning policy. This doesn't add value uh, and rather than pages and pages of policy wording, I would much prefer to see a clear local spatial strategy to guide future development. Authorities will be able to bring forward tailored local policies where there is a clear justification to do so. And this would be explored and tested at the gate check stage. Uh, and we will restructure our existing policy framework so that it acknowledges significant differences between planning matters in different areas. I would therefore ask the committee to reject Amendment 185. Uh, the remainder of the amendments in this group seek to add specific issues to what the National Planning Framework must contain or take into account. 
I cannot support most of these amendments. It's not that the issues are not important, but that they are all, all, all already covered in the framework or the Scottish planning policy that will in future be incorporated into it. Uh, my aims here are to ensure that we do not du duplicate existing requirements and to avoid the primary legislation becoming overly prescriptive. Housing is clearly key to development planning, and Amendment 116 explicitly states that the MPF must set out a statement of housing land requirements. Uh, we are reviewing the methodology for addressing this, but have not yet determined whether targets are the most appropriate approach. Other options might include, uh, for example, setting out estimates, aspirations, minimum requirements, or a range of these. And there could be tensions if the national planning framework went too far in imposing targets for housing in local areas. So this needs careful consideration. Um, and I therefore do not support Graham Simpson's or Alexander Stewart's amendments seeking to set targets. The methodology for addressing housing land requirements will also consider how the needs for different types of housing should be assessed. Currently, as part of the housing needs and demand assessment, local authorities are required to consider the need for specialist provision. This covers accessible and adapted housing, wheelchair housing and supported accommodation, including care homes and sheltered housing. Needs for other types of accommodation for different types of households and, for example, gypsy traveller communities also has to be considered. And all of this will feed into the national planning framework. Our programme for government reaffirms our commitment uh, to delivering more wheelchair accessible housing to help people who need, to, need it to live independently in their communities. And these are important issues. But I... Very briefly, I'll take Mr. Whiteman, um, conv convener. Um, I, I, I'll take him now. I, I do have a, a lot here, convener, as you I'll can well understand. Very brief. Th uh, thank the minister. Just to clarify that I, I fully understand the minister pointing out that many of these policy areas are already taken into account. I think the, the key thing as a matter of principle here is that they are not being taken into account uh, by... Um, by statute, they're not required to be taken into account. I don't doubt that they are. I don't doubt the Scottish planning policy effectively cover these, and I don't doubt the good intentions of the programme for government. But there's a distinction between ministers in a particular administration having good policies towards something, and there being a statutory requirement that these form part of the national planning framework. Uh, in terms of the national planning framework and what our intent is in terms of Scottish planning policy, um, we are putting a number of new things in place to allow for this. What I don't want um, is duplication. And what I don't want, um, I have to say, is, some, uh, uh, is what we've been accused of by some during the course of this, where we centrally um, are making decisions that local authorities themselves need to make in their local development plans when it comes uh, to decisions around about house numbers, um, etc. Um, if I can go back to, to, to the point around about uh, our seriousness around about these, um, uh, these issues, but I don't believe um, it is appropriate in some of these circumstances to highlight one particular group of people in the national planning framework and the way that amendments 167 and 116 are would do, and I can't support them. I recognise that further amendments in a similar vein will be considered um, when the um, committee discusses local development plans. And Monica Lennon's amendments in assessing the health impacts of development and Andy Whiteman's in gender would duplicate existing impact assessments, which sit within a much more comprehensive framework. Health impact assessment is undertaken as a matter of course as part of the strategic environmental assessment of any part of the development plan, followed up where required by more detailed environmental impact assessment at project level. 
In terms of gender inequality issues, the 1997 Act already requires ministers and planning authorities to perform their functions under this Act in a manner which encourages equal opportunities. In addition, ministers and local authorities are subject uh, to both the Fairer Scotland duty and the public sector equality duty deriving from the Equality Act 2010. The public sector equality duty in particular requires the assessing of evidence, the commissioning of research or consultation as appropriate, <coughs> the consideration of mitigating factors and the publication of the, author of the authority's conclusion. It is also re regulated by the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which can take appropriate action if authorities are not compliant. My amendment 116 would require the Scottish Ministers to provide the Parliament with a summary of the findings of any assessment of the likely impact of the proposed revised national planning framework, which will, would include the equality impact assessment and strategic impact assessment. The Scottish Government takes these issues seriously, uh, but these amendments would simply introduce, introduce additional bureaucracy without any additional benefits. And I would ask the committee to reject amendments 104 and 116P, 83, 83A and 116F. Uh, once again, I have no objection in principle uh, to John Finney's Amendment 160, and he'll find me uh, much persuaded uh, with other amendments that will come in due course uh, on preserving disused railway lines that may be suitable for future public transport. Uh, this is already established as a policy in paragraph 277 of the Scottish planning policy. This will, of course, have greater weight in the future if the SPP, as part of the MPS, has development plan status. However, I would ask Mr Finney not to move Amendment 160, given that it is already covered in policy, and I feel that it is too specific in this con context. Uh, Graham Simpson and Rhoda Grant are both seeking to ensure that the national planning framework takes into account the impact of wider legislation, policies and strategies. I'm conscious that many stakeholders support stronger alignment of MPF with wider policies and strategies, and I agree that this is very important. Uh, this has always been done with MPF 3, having done a particularly thorough job of bringing together um, that wider policy context for planning. The list in Graham Simpson's amendment could be viewed as incomplete, um, and it will become outdated in time. Although I understand that this is not intended to be comprehensive, planning authorities could consider that the policies listed here have a greater importance than others. I also have concerns about uh, Rhoda Grant's amendment as it would lead to the addition of a potentially significant volume of quite detailed and technical information. I would therefore ask Graham Simpson and Rhoda Grant not to move their amendments Instead, I would be very happy to work um, with Mr Simpson and Ms Grant to bring forward a high-level requirement for the national planning framework to reflect other national policies and strategies at stage three. Uh, Claudia Beamish's amendments 214 and 116V uh, would require the national planning framework to have regards to the infrastructure investment plan when designating national developments. The Scottish Government has already stated that it will seek to align the next version of the National Planning Framework with the Infrastructure Investment Plan. I also want to ensure that future iterations of the Infrastructure Investment Plan reflect the National Planning Framework. This is a clear priority. Uh, that does not mean that all national development must be fully funded in the Infrastructure Investment Plan. The National Planning Framework can include unfunded long-term aspirational projects, as well as those which are more immediately deliverable, and responsibility for delivery is shared by public and private sectors. However, with all of that in mind, I am comfortable in supporting Amendments 214 and 116V in the name of Claudia Beamish. Um, turning to Rhoda Grant's uh, amendments 211 and 212 on resettling rural, rural land with their equivalents uh, 116R and T. Um, I have a, a lot of sympathy uh, for those who criticise planning 
for sometimes taking an urban-centric view of what our countryside is for. Uh, it is critical uh, that the planning system plays a more active role in meeting the needs of rural communities. I think that we can all agree uh, that planning can, can and should do more to support our rural communities. I also agree that, in principle, resettling previously populated areas could help to achieve this. However, before we fully establish that as a requirement within the legislation, there does need to be fuller analysis and consultation on these proposals. Uh, resettlement may not be appropriate in every area, and this Parliament should not go too far in instructing local authorities to address this matter. We need to look at potential pitfalls, um, such as the provision uh, of public services, the impact on climate change emissions, and the risk of unfettered rural development out of keeping with the area. If I may stray into another subgroup for just a moment, convener, um, I would suggest that Alistair Allen's amendments, which we will come to later, um, are a little bit more measured and therefore more appropriate for primary legislation. Um, so I would ask Rhoda Grant not to move her amendment to allow us to do the work that needs to be done on all of this um, in a sensible way. I thank you for your patience, uh, convener. I know that's very long, but I've tried to address all elements of what is in front of us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Minister. Uh, we'll now have a short break before we move on to the debate on the next subgroup. So.
we, we now move to the debate on the next subgroup, and I remind members that we will dispose of amendments after having debated all five subgroups. Um, so we move to the debate on the second subgroup on consultation on the National Planning Framework, and I ask Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 215 and other amendments in the subgroup. Monica. Thank you, um, convener. Um, I'll speak to Amendment 215, um, which intends to improve transparency in the planning system. Um, we all seem to agree that planning is about land being used in the public interest and that the public must know how planning decisions are being made. As it stands, it's not always immediately obvious how decisions are reached and who is consulted and why, and it's not always uh, very easy to find that out. This amendment will clearly lay out who has been consulted, when, and provide opportunities to ensure that the right organisations are being consulted. Uh, because planning decisions, as we know, can have lots of unintended consequences. Uh, for example, um, building a, a football pitch does not just have implications for, for sport, but for young people, the wider community and our health, which is our, our recurring uh, theme today. So I, I move the amendment, convener. My apologies, my apologies. Uh, uh, Kenneth Gibson, speak to Amendment 169 and other amendments in the subgroup. Uh, Convene Amendments 169 and 116C, um, specifying the need to consult with older people and disabled people and their families, uh, such persons as represent the interests of older people and disabled people, including organisations working for and on behalf of older people and disabled people. In addition, it also specifies carers, planning authorities, registered social landlords and developers. Uh, the purpose of these is to embed in legislation the requirement for consultation developing the national planning framework and require the Scottish Government to consult in respect of the targets to be set by Scottish Ministers with a range of people on the housing needs of older and disabled people. And Rhoda Grant to speak to Amendment 216. Thank you, Convener. Um, I will speak to Amendment 216 and a one one six w um, I set the scene for these amendments earlier, so I won't um, repeat any of those um, statements. These amendments relate to maps of no longer inhabited human settlements and associated material contained and debated earlier in Amendment 212 and 1160 and makes the provision for public consultation on the criteria for developing these maps and associated material. Um, and again, I'm hedging my bets with the two amendments depending on what happens to Amendment 116. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'm going to let Monica Lennon back in to speak to another amendment which has been spoken. Thank last you, time. convener. Yeah, just second to order, I wanted to speak to, to 186. Um, this is about, you know, in preparing the national planning framework that ministers must consult the chief medical officer and the chief executive of NHS Scotland. Um, this amendment follows the theme of embedding the consideration of health into the planning system to ensure a positive impact on health outcomes across Scotland. In a similar vein to ensuring that health is considered in the preparation of the national planning framework, requiring the consultation of the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Executive of NHS Scotland is intended to ensure that ministers are taking into account the main challenges and opportunities relating to the nation's health when they prepare the national planning framework. This amendment also requires any representation to be published in order to inform parliamentary scrutiny of the national planning framework because for proper scrutiny to occur, Parliament must be made aware of the recommend recommendations that are being made by the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Exec of NHS Scotland. So I also move that amendment, Convener. Thank you. And there's no other amendments in that subgroup you wish to speak on? OK. okay. Uh, we now move on to the debate on the third subgroup. Oh, Minister, my apologies. See. <laughs> I thought you were leaving me out there. Ah, well, there was so little for you to talk about, so I thought. Uh, a little less this time than the last time, I think. Um, before I go through each of the amendments in turn, I'd like to point out that the consultation on the national planning framework is, as a matter of course, uh, very broad ranging and inclusive. And I would also remind the committee um, that there is already a requirement for a participation statement to be prepared, setting out what, who is expected to be consulted and when. Each of these uh, amendments is seeking a, a relatively detailed approach to prescri prescribing consultation requirements, uh, and I'm not convinced that these additional requirements are appropriate. I understand the thinking 
uh, behind Ms Lennon's Amendment 186 and 116J, I too recognise and respect the importance of planning to health uh, and health to planning. Uh, this amendment would introduce a requirement for ministers to consult with the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Executive of NHS Scotland in preparing the National Planning Framework. I think we need to be, uh, avoid being too prescriptive in primary legislation, naming key individuals and organisations, whereas other consultees are usually set out in secondary legislation. I would question whether it is appropriate to single out two individual offices when the consultation on the MPF is required to be very broad and inclusive. Many other sectors and stakeholders could no doubt argue that they should also be included on this list, and setting out a comprehensive list in primary legislation would be impossible. And I would ask the committee to reject this amendment. Uh, uh, certainly, Mr Simpson. Um, so, it, it, would you accept it's possible to name people that you have to consult with uh, while not preventing you consulting with others, you know, you, do you accept that we can name name people that you need to consult with? Uh, that does not prevent a wider consult consultation. It has been uh, the norm in this uh, Parliament to deal with these matters in secondary um, legislation. I think uh, naming individuals or organisations and not naming others can often cause quite a lot of grief. Um, in terms of setting that out in primary legislation. And I do think that it is much better to do that in secondary legislation because there will no doubt be others who will come forward who will say you know, that they should be um, named in the primary legislation too if certain individuals uh, or organisations are named. In terms of Kenneth Gibson in Amendments 169 and 116C, which is proposing an extensive list of specific interests to consult to inform his proposed targets on housing for older and disabled people, his amendment focuses on the requirement for the participation statement for the National Planning Framework. Again, um, I, I agree that this is an important issue, but have concerns that this amendment is too narrowly defined when many different interests could equally argue uh, that they should be listed um, here. Uh, would, uh, I will do, convener. I mean, I think the issue is, though, that uh, the problem has been, I think, a lot of members uh, accept what you're saying in principle, but our experience so far is that this hasn't really happened, and that's why this belt and braces approach has been brought in by a number of members across the committee. Mm -hmm. um, convener, Mr Gibson has been uh, a member of this parliament for a very long time. Um, and he will know the difficulties that there are at points in naming some groups or some things in primary legislation and not others. Um, it has been the norm to deal with this um, through secondary legislation. Um, I've said that I agree uh, that we have to look at what is required in terms of housing for older and disabled people. Nobody would dispute that. And he can be assured um, that I will be doing uh, all that I can to uh, ensure that their views are heard. But I don't think that necessarily needs to be listed in primary legislation, convener. Um, uh, with regards to amendments 216 and 116W from Rhoda Grant, uh, I agree that if there is to be a map of no longer inhabited settlements included in the National Planning Framework, consultation should be undertaken. However, I would make the same point that this is a very specific requirement and should not be necessary. Uh, I cannot support Monica Lennon's amendments 215 and 116Q and what they propose even in principle. The amendments would require the National Planning Framework to, conclude, to include a complete list of persons to be consulted in the carrying out of any and all planning functions under the 1997 Act. The circumstances for and purpose of consulting them would also have to be set out. This is not a proportionate approach and would be difficult, if not impossible, to achieve in practice. The Scottish ministers and planning authorities are required to consult the public at large. 
How far would Ms Lennon expect us to go in identifying individuals and organisations within that and predicting the potential scope of future amendments and the exact people who would be in interested in each and how those people and organ organisations might change over a 10-year period? To conclude, I would ask the committee to bear in mind that we are seeking to streamline the system rather than burdening it with additional requirements that are unnecessary. And in the case of amendments 215 and 116Q, um, impossible to implement. I would ask members not to press the amendments in this subgroup. Thank you, Minister. Um, we now move on to... I just wanted to ask a question. Should I? Sorry, I've caught him before he finished. You never got to him before he was finished. No, I didn't get to him. Before no, he so if the question could be asked at the next stage, then you'll get to ask it then. Okay, I shall okay. do that. Uh, we now move to the debate on the third subgroup. Uh, Andy Whiteman to speak to Amendment 187 and other amendments in the subgroup. Thank you, Convener. My Amendment 187 is a guidance power in relation to my Amendment 83 already debated. Uh, on, I don't have anything further really to add to that. It's uh, self-explanatory. Um, I'll leave my remarks at that. Thank you very much. Uh, would everybody please follow in the footsteps of Mr. Whiteman there? Uh, we now move on to Claire Baker to speak to Amendment 71 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, convener. I'm pleased to speak to Amendment 71 and 116K. Amendment 71 seeks to add cultural to the list of characteristics which need to be considered in the advice given to Scottish ministers for the national planning framework. Uh, this amendment recognises the importance of cultural assets to communities and including it in the bill would reflect the recent inclusion of culture as an outcome in the national performance framework. It would indicate the significance of culture and recognise its benefits to society. Recognising that local government is under significant financial pressures, culture is an area which lacks statutory protection and can be an area which is vulnerable and at risk of being overlooked or undervalued. So this amendment seeks to recognise the importance of local cultural assets and access in decision making. Amendment 116K has the same aim as Amendment 71 and protects the amendment if the committee agrees to the Minister's amendment which would replace Section 1. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Graham Simpson to speak to Amendment 72 and other amendments in the subgroup. Thanks, Convener. Um, amendment 72 um, is, uh, I don't think, particularly controversial. Um, it includes a reference to including built heritage within the MPF. So a planning uh, authority must uh, provide information about the built heritage uh, of an area when preferring, uh, preparing the MPF. Um, Amendment 32, um, our intention there uh, was to make it an obligation within a new section 3AA2 to the 1997 Act that information on housing needs and education capacity are included as matters to be taken into consideration in the formulation of a national planning framework. Um, uh, from what I was hearing from the Minister earlier, he didn't seem to uh, go along with that, but I, I will be pressing that. Uh, amendment 33 uh, relates to the capacity of education services, um, so very, very, very similar to the, the, the previous one. Um, both these amendments are backed by Homes for Scotland. Uh, I have to say they don't like everything uh, I've put forward. I have mentioned them, but they're, they're not in favour of everything, uh, but they are in favour of this. Um, now, they say uh, Amendment 32 would assist the target-setting role of the MPF by ensuring evidence on housing need is provided to ministers by planning authorities for the purpose of MPF preparation. Uh, and on a point of detail, if need is intended here, um, that they, they could, you know, um, all tenures, then this should be made clear. Um, I have others, if you just bear with me, convener. Um, the others, uh, convener, I think we've touched on their, their amendments to uh, 116, so I'll not speak on them. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to Monica Lennon to speak to amendments 105 and any other amendments in the subgroup. Thank you, convener. I'll speak to 105 and 106. Um, 105, this amendment is intended to ensure that the National Planning Framework considers the impact of developments on the capacity of existing health services in the area. 
It is intended to ensure that the development of the National Planning Framework is responsive to the health needs of the population and that there is a direct link between development of the framework and consideration of the capacity of health services. We all know that the impact of development on health services is profound, whether it is increased demand affecting capacity due to an influx of properties within a particular area, or whether it is the unintended consequences of the development of other infrastructure and transport links. This amendment is intended to make sure not only that there is a much clearer link between the NPF and the consequences of development on health outcomes, but also that the NPF is more cognizant of the needs of our health services and unintended consequences of development. And 106 is, 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 is similar to 105. Um, it tends to make sure that the NPF must make specific consideration of the health needs of the population when it's being drawn up, so that there is a much clearer link between the proposed development in the National Planning Framework and any unintended health consequences, depending on the health needs of the population, the impact of certain developments on air quality, for example, and the potential health effects of the population should be explicitly considered when the NPF is being drafted. And this very much um, connects back to my earlier um, amendments, which seek to consult the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Executive of the NHS. And, you know, I, I'm sure it's not what the Minister is intending, but when we talk about... Um, you know, consultation and, and having lists of consultees being burdensome. I think, you know, we, we have to remember that, you know, a, a people-centred and rights-based approach to planning is, 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 is better for, for everyone. And, you know, I, I think, you know, if we're saying that it's problematic to say in legislation that, you know, the chief medical officer has to be consulted, um, you know, I, I think we have to give it you know, look at the way we're approaching this. So um, I don't believe that any of these amendments are burdensome. I think it is really important that people do have a rights-based approach to planning. People know that they can be consulted. It doesn't exclude others from being involved. But, you know, we've heard um, time and again during our evidence sessions about people who feel they have not been taken into account of. And that's why, in particular, um, as well as community councils, I've also introduced um, that the access panels be consulted um, because people with disabilities, people, older people, feel that their needs are not being taken into account and these things shouldn't be left to discretion or to chance. So that's why this Belt and Braces approach um, is very much required. So I, I move 105 and 106, convener. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, Kenny Gibson to speak to Amendment 170. Thanks, Convener. Amendments 117 and 116D seek to ensure that when the principal purpose for which land and area is used, the needs of disabled people and older people are taken into account. Uh, these amendments introduce a duty to provide information about the housing needs of older people and of disabled people within the planning authority area. This enables Scottish ministers when preparing or revising the National Planning Framework to require planning authorities to assist this process by providing information about the housing needs of older people within the planning authority area and disabled people. Uh, this will give Scottish ministers the powers when preparing and revising a national pl planning framework to direct one or more planning authorities to provide information about certain uh, matters in relation to an area specified in the direction, including, for example, the principal physical, economic, social and environmental characteristics of the area, etc. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Uh, and Rhoda Grant to speak to Amendment 217 and other amendments in the subgroup. Um, can I speak to 217 and 116AA, which again is taking the belt and braces approach. Um, and again, I won't rehearse the arguments that I made earlier, but they stand for this amendment too. This amendment refers to the desirability of allocating land for the purposes of resettlement. It would become one of the matters to be referred to in information to assist the preparation of the National Planning Framework. It would invite consideration in this context of the desirability of allocating land for the purpose of achieving resettlement, a practical step that may be helpful on the way to actually achieving resettlement. It provides ministers with the powers to do this, which I hope they would find helpful. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Claudia Beamish to speak to Amendment 218 and other amendments. Thank you, Convener. 
Uh, my amendment 218 seeks to enhance recognition of the importance of renewable energy in our future planning decisions. It enables Scottish ministers to direct a planning authority or authorities to provide information on the particular land available for development and use of facilities for renewable sources of energy to contribute to our supplies. This information will assist, in my view, ministers in preparing and reviewing the NPF. Two, 208 add specific reference to renewables provisions at the end of the list of other infrastructure matters, communications, transport, drainage systems, and systems for the supply of water and energy. While I appreciate that energy is already highlighted, my amendment emphasises that renewables need a joined up government approach and that we will, this, and it will be helped um, to continue uh, to emphasise that it is vitally important that we succeed in the shift to a zero carbon economy. Adding renewable energy to the list of specifications before preparing the NPF bolsters that imperative and I believe also gives confidence to the sector and, and points in the appropriate direction. Um, as with others, Amendment 116AE uh, has the same effect and was submitted as a contingency. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, in this group, subgroup is Alistair Allen to speak to Amendment 116L and other amendments in subgroup. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, if I may speak to uh, 116L and 116M, uh, I'll speak to two other uh, amendments later on in proceeding. Um, I want to say really that these amendments, uh, the two amendments here, are, are driven um, by working with Community Land Scotland uh, and also driven by the experience uh, of being an island MSP, recognising the need uh, for people in rural Scotland and recognising too that. Um, planners need to understand uh, that some communities will either develop or die, and I hope that this is a, a practical and proportionate way of recognising those facts. 116L, convener, um, relates to the Scottish Government, uh, Amendment 116 on the National Planning Framework. Amendment 116L would require planning authorities to provide information on the extent to which there are rural areas um, where there has been a substantial decline in population, uh, where they are directed by ministers to do so to inform the preparation of the national planning framework. This would mean that rural depopulation is effectively established as a principle um, for the national planning framework to address. Uh, in saying that, uh, I um, understand the point the minister has, has made about non-duplication of effort here, but I, I would hope for an, an assurance uh, from the minister at this stage um, that he will use the new powers uh, to establish in the NPF the principle that planning decisions should specifically have regard to the need to repopulate rural Scotland. Uh, on uh, 116M, convener, um, this amendment gives power to ministers to define what constitutes a rural area uh, and uh, substantial decline uh, when they come to form those regulations. Thank you very much. Uh, and before I go to the minister, I'm going to go back to Monica Lennon, who's got another amendment she'd like to speak to. Yeah, I'd like to speak to Amendment 219, convener. Um, this is regarding the addition of advice on the compatibility um, with statutory climate targets before publishing the draft NPF. Um, as with health, we recognise that the planning system has a huge part to play in protecting the environment and, where possible, limiting the negative impact we have on the planet. Um, I believe we have to give both Minister and planners the tools to make this possible, and this amendment offers such a tool. The Parliament recognises that the statutory climate targets are an important indicator of our work to protect against climate change. This amendment allows ministers to understand the impact that the NPF will have on those targets and our work to achieve them. I, I move Amendment 219, Convener. Thank you very much for that. And before I let the Minister in, can I just say that once the Minister stops speaking on this, that's the end of this section and we're moving on to the other one, so don't be asking questions after. If you want to intervene, then if you'll take an intervention, then that's fine. Hey, Minister. Uh, thank you, Convener. All of the amendments in this group uh, seek to add specific issues to the information that can be sought by ministers to inform the national planning framework. In considering these amendments, I'm keen to ensure that the bill does not duplicate existing requirements and avoids becoming overly prescriptive. I'm also conscious that in some cases similar amendments have been proposed for local development plans. Um, I would ask the committee to bear in mind that some issues may be more appropriate for more detailed local level planning. Uh, 
uh, and there will be an opportunity to consider, that, consider this further in a later group. Andy Whiteman's Amendment 187 and 116 G uh, would require Scottish ministers to issue guidance to local authorities on his proposed section 3A, 3A on considering impacts in relation to gender. I have already highlighted the existing public sector equality duty, which applies to ministers and local authorities, and the Equality and Human Rights Commission issues technical guidance on that duty. I do not think we should seek to cut across or duplicate their responsibilities. I agree with uh, Claire Baker's Amendment 71 uh, and 116K. Uh, the government wants to see culture at the heart of policy making, and this amendment can reinforce uh, the importance of cultural facilities and opportunities through good placemaking and the very positive contribution they make to life in Scotland. It is proportionate, it is in the right place, and I'm very happy to support it. Uh, I have no objection to Amendment 72 uh, and 116Z, it was very American, Z, um, in the name of Graham Simpson. Uh, our built heritage is addressed in the national planning framework as a matter of course and could be argued to be covered by the broader he he heading of environment. However, I agree that this is an important part of the quality, distinctiveness and identity of our many places and that it would be useful to highlight it as a matter for authorities to consider as part of their plans. Amendment 32, also from Graham Simpson, adds housing needs of the population in, in an area to the list of information that authorities can be asked to provide to inform the MPF. Amendments 33 uh, and 116 AD, also from Graham Simpson, add the capacity of education services to that list. In my view, the wording of Amendment 116 in my name is preferable um, to both of these proposals. Uh, with regard to housing, pl planning terminology usually only equates need with affordable housing. The requirement could also arise from out with an area rather than being specific to the population within an area, as suggested by Mr Simpson's amendment. My amendment includes housing in the list of information required for MPF, but goes beyond needs to also encompass demand by referring to the availability of land in the area for housing and the availability of and requirements for housing in the area. Amendment 116 also reflects education as a type of infrastructure and focuses on facilities to align this with de development and land use rather than the broader approach in Amendment 33. Whilst I support Graham Simpson's amendments on housing and education in principle, I would ask that he not move them uh, as these matters are now addressed in Amendment 116. I agree with the aims of Monica Lennon's amendments 105, 116 AB, 106 and 116 AC. It is important that we understand and address the impacts of de development on people's health and well-being and development planning should take into account the capacity of health services. I am content to support Amendment 105 uh, and 116AB, although I would suggest that it would sit more naturally in the list of infrastructure types set out under Section 3AG2D of Amendment 116. Perhaps I might discuss that with Ms Lennon before Stage 3. However, I find it difficult to support the breadth of Amendment 106. Uh, planning authorities cannot be expected to fully explore all of the health needs of the population of their area. I recognise that planning in place can make a big difference to people's health and well-being uh, by supporting them to be more active, to interact with others, and by preventing uh, developments which could have a significant effect or mitigating their impacts to an acceptable level. And, of course, have suitable housing and employment uh, and having suitable housing and employment is important to health as well. However, some aspects of health have made nothing uh, at all to do with de development planning um, or uh, land use. Um, and springing to, what springs to mind immediately is smoking, alcohol related uh, diseases, um, contraception. Um, for example, 
and uh, nothing to do with planning use. So we need to be careful that we're not expecting the planning system to address all of society's issues. Rather, I would prefer authorities to have a clearer understanding of health infrastructure and its relationship with future development, as would be the case if the committee supports Amendment 105. Um, while I do not think that housing needs for specific groups should be highlighted at the top level of the national planning framework, I am happy to accept Kenneth Gibson's amendments 170 and 116D to ensure that the housing needs of older and disabled people are a matter on which local authorities may be asked to provide information. I mentioned before that I feel Alistair Allen's amendments on addressing rural depopulation are more appropriate than that of Rhoda Grants. I understand that both uh, have been inspired by calls from uh, Community Land Scotland for planning to address the issue. I have a lot of sympathy uh, for those who criticise our planning system as it applies um, to rural areas. I've said that previously, I reiterate that, um, and I took part in a rural planning summit last Friday to hear the views uh, of folks who feel that we could be doing more on that front. Um, I am concerned that too often uh, communities are unable to sustain vital, vital local services or to meet their own housing needs partly, if not wholly, as a result of an overly restrictive planning policy. And that in some cases, um, environmental considerations are put ahead of the needs of local people. Both are important and needs to be considered in national, strategic and local development planning. Local communities recognise the value of their environment. It makes a major contribution to their quality of life and to the tourism that is often important uh, to local economies in rural, rural areas. But that quality of life will suffer if we cannot deliver the homes and, and facilities uh, that people need or if we are unable to sustain whole communities in the long term as a result of overly restrictive rural planning policies. I'm particularly struck by the positive approach to development uh, which communities in remote parts of Scotland take and by the work of Community Land Scotland in supporting uh, and empowering communities to take ownership of the future of their own places. These initiatives are forerunners to a more positive planning system uh, which will also give people the right to plan uh, their own places. I agree that the National Planning Framework has an important role to play in tackling uh, the issue of rural depopulation. I want to open a fuller debate on how we can sustain and grow rural communities, including by repopulating areas where people used to live when we begin the review of the National Planning Framework after this bill. Uh, referring to this in the bill will ensure that this happens. Um, as I said before, I'm sympathetic to all of these amendments, but I'm concerned that Rhoda Grants go too far in setting out detailed policy in the bill. And I would ask her not to move those amendments and recommend the committee support Alistair Allen's <coughs> amendments instead. Amendments 218 and 116AE from Claudia Beamish uh, would provide that where ministers direct planning authorities to provide information on energy uh, to inform the national planning framework, that this uh, can include particular land available for uh, renewable energy. Uh, planning has an important role to play in providing a steer on where this type of development should and should not take place. National Planning Framework 3 uh, explored Scotland as a low carbon place. And uh, even since 2014, technologies have continued to emerge and will be considered in National Planning Framework 4. It is arguable that Section 3AG already covers all types of energy, but given the importance of renewable energy in relation to climate change and the additional spatial focus which this amendment would bring, I'm happy to support it. Finally, I turn to Monica Lennon's amendments 219 and 116N. Uh, the National Planning Framework has an important role to play in helping us to meet our climate change targets. 
Adapting to the impact of climate change is also a key priority um, for a long-term spatial strategy. MPF3 introduced many proposals uh, which will help us to reduce emissions such as low carbon energy generation and sustainable transport. While the national planning framework has to take into account many different, often competing policy objectives, it should, as a whole, have a positive impact on climate change. Any consul consultation on a national plan planning framework would naturally include a debate about its impact on climate change. This would also be assessed as part of a strategic environmental assessment of the MPF as a result of existing statutory requirements. Once again, this amendment is simply duplicating existing statutory requirements. The Climate Change Scotland Act 2009 states that a public body must, in exercising its functions, act in the way best calculated to contribute to the delivery of the target set out in the Act. And the Climate Change Committee is required to give advice on that duty. Um, I do not consider that it is helpful or necessary to essentially restate that requirement, but in a slightly different way, way relating specifically to the national planning framework. I also have concerns about the additional resources involved in formally seeking advice from the relevant body on this specific matter in addition to the existing duties. Can I ask, has Monica Lennon even consulted the Climate Change Committee on whether they consider this ad additional duty to be helpful. I do not believe that these amendments will really add value to the planning system and I would ask Monica Lennon not to move them today. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we'll now move to the debate on the fourth subgroup and I ask Graham Simpson to speak to Amendment 38 and other amendments <coughs> in the group. Um, thank you very much, Convener. Um, there was a, a lot of uh, debate and discussion uh, in the committee uh, around the issue of whether the national planning framework could be amended or should be amended uh, by MSPs. Um, and, and, and the view of the committee was that, that it, we, we should have that ability to do that. Now, currently, uh, as things stand, there isn't a parliamentary procedure that that would allow that. So the Belt and Braces approach is to introduce a National Planning Framework Bill, which is what Amendment 38 would do. Now, I fully accept um, that this is unusual, difficult, um, and, uh, I, 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 and for that reason I'll not be moving it, but I'd, I wanted to get it on, on the table um, that, that was the reason behind it. So, uh, as an alternative, I've introduced uh, Amendment 39. It's not quite as far as I'd like to go, um, but it does introduce uh, a greater level of scrutiny uh, and, uh, and ability for MSPs to have a say over the national planning framework. And I think um, the, 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 the government's uh, re reluctance to accept this point is the reason why you've had a lot of amendments which deal with policy areas uh, on, on this bill. Um, I think uh, MSPs have uh, pushed back uh, and, and seen an opportunity here to, to get policy things into a bill, whereas um, if the government uh, had uh, taken a different approach, um, that, might, that may not have happened. Now, Amendment 6 um, ensures that the time limit uh, for scrutiny of the MPF should be at least uh, 120 days, but I believe if we pass uh, Amendment 39, that would be negated. However, Andy Whiteman um, has a, a similar amendment which I'd be minded to support. Amendment 40 uh, calls for a simple annual report mechanism uh, for the MPF. It doesn't say in any, any detail what that should cover. That, that can probably be dealt with by regulations, uh, but it must be submitted at the end of the calendar year. Um, now, I would uh, accept that uh, perhaps uh, an annual report, uh, the, the government might think that too onerous. I don't think it is for government. Uh, I think government's capable of uh, doing that. Um, Amendment 116X uh, ensures that the 
Scottish ministers may not bring into effect the national planning framework until a draft of it has been approved by resolution of the Parliament. Uh, so the amendment supports the super affirmative procedure for consideration of the NPF. Uh, as that really goes back to uh, what I was saying earlier about the ability of MSPs to influence uh, the, the, the MPF. Now, finally, uh, 116Y, uh, this calls for, um, I think uh, it's very similar to the previous one, uh, an annual report mechanism uh, of the MPF. So I think um, I've made, uh, made my points. Uh, it is all about scrutiny, the ability of MSPs to have a say uh, and to influence. Uh, and I don't think the government's going far enough. Um, so they may, need, they may wish to reflect on that for stage three. OK, thank you. Uh, Andy, speak to amendments 39A and other amendments. Uh, thanks very much, Camilla. This is a very important group of amendments, as has already been alluded to by... Uh, Graham Simpson. The, the bill proposes that the national planning framework become part of the development plan for an area alongside the local development plan. Uh, that, is, that is new. Uh, that's not been the case uh, to date and that's an important reform which I agree with and I, um, as I recollect, the committee agrees with um, as well. Now, unlike the local development plan, the national planning framework has got no democratic underpinning. Uh, it is a plan of ministers, and although Parliament's consulted on it, Parliament has no role in approving that plan. <clears throat> I think given that we have a spatial planning system that's based on uh, the development of proposals and ideas and debate, which, uh, as things stand at the moment, uh, ultimately gets to a point where a democratically elected body adopts the plan or agrees the plan, that similar procedures have to be put in place <coughs> with regard to the national planning framework. if as I say, the bill, and I agree with this, uh, proposes that it become part of the development plan. If these arrangements are not put in place, I think it's very important to highlight the fact that there'd be nothing to stop a minority government of a party, for example, who wishes to uh, 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 implement fracking. There'd be nothing to stop such a minority government of a party that wished to do that, to make that part of the national planning framework incorporating such a proposal in it, having that opposed by Parliament, and yet it becomes part of the development plan, probably against the wishes of most local authorities and most of the population. And as I say, in a democratic planning system, this is wrong. And therefore, therefore pleased that the government has accepted the key recommendation in stage one to rectify this and make the plan subject to resolution of Parliament. Amendment 39 in Graham Simpson's name provides, in my view, an elegant legislative solution by way of what is now an established, although not a formal mechanism, a super affirmative procedure. And I prefer the simplicity and elegance of this and its increasing familiarity in Parliament to the rather more long-winded drafting of 116. I disagree with the proposition in Amendment 38, and Graham Simpson's already indicated he won't move that, so I'll say nothing more uh, on that. My amendments 39A and B are to extend the period of parliamentary scrutiny of a draft national planning framework to no more than 120 days. The stage one committee uh, recommended that there shall be no statutory limits for Parliament. I think it is, I think uh, ministers do require, and I think ministers do deserve, some certainty in the timetabling, their own timetabling. And while 60 days at the moment is probably too short, it could be done in 60 days if it was a very modest national planning framework. Um, if that were possible, but anything up to 120 would be allowed by my amendments, but that does not mean that Parliament would necessarily use up to 120. Finally, on Amendment uh, 40, this requires annual reports to the National Planning Framework. My own view is this is unnecessary. I think it's disproportionate. I don't think it's a good use of Scottish Minister's resources, and I'll not be uh, supporting it. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, Minister? Um, thank you very much, Convener. Can I first of all say um, I'm delighted to hear that uh, Mr Simpson won't be moving um, Amendment 38 in terms of uh, introducing the MPF as a, a bill uh, for an act of Parliament. Um, we uh, were trying to uh, work out how that could be done and uh, you know that would be extremely uh, difficult uh, indeed. 
Um, so I'm pleased that um, uh, Mr Simpson has says that he is not uh, going to move Amendment 38. I know that we all have taken the opportunity at points to use these kind of probing uh, uh, amendments and I, um, I, I, I'm glad that you've seen that this probing amendment is maybe um, one too, too far. Um, amendment 39 and 116X, also by Mr Simpson, uh, separately proposes that the Scottish Parliament approves the draft MPF. Amendment 116 in my name also addresses approval of the MPF uh, by a resolution of the Scottish Parliament. Um, this is a significant change that I'm proposing uh, in direct response to the Committee Stage 1 report. Um, I have other concerns with um, Mr Simpson's uh, proposed procedures um, seeking representations alongside the period for parliamentary scrutiny I believe is unnecessary as a draft will have already been subjected to full pub public consultation and extensive engagement prior to, be laid in, prior to being <coughs> laid in the parliament. Uh, this comes under step two in Amendment 116, and I'm not sure why the requirements relating to non-disclosure or representations would be necessary in the context of the General Data Protection Regulations or how they would interact with that wider legislation and the Information Commissioner's responsibilities. Um, I agree with Mr Simpson's approach in subsection six. Um, requiring additional consultation to be undertaken uh, where changes are made at this point. But this is already required in the case of significant amendments under the terms of the Environmental Assessment Scotland Act 2005. Uh, on timescales for parliamentary scrutiny of the National Planning Framework, Amendment 6, six suggests that the period for uh, parliamentary scrutiny should be set at a minimum of 120 days. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, unnecessarily lengthy and open-ended. Andy Whiteman proposes a maximum period of 120 days in Amendments 39A and 39B and 116H. Um, this is a bit clearer as it sets a limit to the process. However, either have the potential to generate significant delay and uncertainty uh, that would have an adverse impact on the planning system as a whole. 120 days is too long and I don't support this. It is important to recognise that this is one part of a lengthy process, including wide public engagement, with past experience showing that this can take around 18 months in total. If the period of 120 <coughs> sitting days was required, this would account for around half of that process. Uh, depending on when in the year the draft MPF is laid. A period of 120 days in Parliament equates to eight or nine months. I, I have some sympathy with the Minister saying that. Does he agree that um, the current period should be lengthened? Um, uh, the time that the Parliament takes to scrutinise the MPF should be in proportion. Uh, uh, amendment 116 um, sets the timescales for consideration to 90 days, and I think that that is proportionate. That's an extension. I think that's proportionate. Uh, this would give Parliament more to time to consider the MPF than it has currently. Um, and the 60-day period for an amendment to the MPF is also ample, given that amendments uh, will on only relate to specific parts of the framework. In practice, ministers can, of course, extend the timescale for scrutiny if Parliament needs additional time. Uh, so I do not support uh, Amendments 39 and 116X, and I would urge the committee to support the procedure set out in Amendment 116. In Amendment 40, um, Graham Simpson proposes an annual progress report on national planning framework to be submitted to the Scottish Parliament. Um, I consider this to be too frequent as timescales for large-scale developments uh, and infrastructure projects are generally much longer, and I don't want to see unnecessary bureaucracy added to the process. Uh, the government already maintains an online action programme for MPF3, uh, which is updated at least once a year, and I'd be happy to provide the committee with links to this if it is of interest to members. Uh, monitoring reports also tend to be published ahead of a revision of the National Planning Framework, but the timing of that is flexible and it's a discretionary approach to ensure reporting is meaningful, meaningful rather than a tick-box exercise. 
Um, I fully believe that our commitment uh, to stronger digital support for the next national planning framework will greatly increase the accessibility of the national planning framework for everyone. Um, whilst I have no objection to reporting on progress in principle, I would ask Graham Simpson not to move this amendment. Beyond all of that, convener, as this committee is well aware, um, I will take uh, Mr Simpson, convener. So is the, is the minister objecting to the, the principle or, or just the frequency of it? As I, as I just said, I'm not... Uh, I, I'm not against reporting on progress in principle at all. I think the frequency of a year is too often. But beyond that, convener, I'm not entirely sure um, what with the monitoring reports and all of the rest of it that we already have um, online, if an annual report is actually um, required. I would say that this committee has never been backward in coming forward at calling me to this committee to account for various things. It may well be that future committees uh, would get more out of all of this if they were call to call ministers uh, to talk more often around about the national planning framework and where it is at. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, we now move to the debate on the final subgroup and ask Alec Cole Hamilton to speak to Amendment 116H and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I have already spoken uh, my reasoning behind 116H. This is my uh, insurance policy for if 185 falls. I think, though, given uh, where we are, should uh, 185 fall, I may decide to withdraw 116H. For that. Minister, would you like to speak to Amendment 128 and other amendments in the group? And uh, be aware, of course, that you, you won't get a chance to sum up. It's uh, later. Uh, amendment 116 in my name introduces the new section 3AB convener, which addresses the amendment of the National Plan Planning Framework. Subsection 2 of that section disapplies the new section 3AC from specified amendments to the National Planning Framework. Uh, this is expected to relate to minor amendments and act on a commitment I made at the stage one uh, to clarify the different procedures for significant and minor amendments. Subsections 3 and 4 allow the Scottish Ministers to make regulations about the procedures for these minor amendments and how, are they, to, how they are to be laid uh, before the Scottish Parliament. The definition of a minor amendment would be prescribed in regulations to be subject to the affirmative procedure so that Parliament can actively agree to what can be exempted from the f uh, full MPF scrutiny and adoption procedure. Amendments 128 and 154 are both consequential of other amendments. Uh, Amendment 128 removes the Section 3CA provisions introduced by the Bill in relation to the amendment of the MPF because those provisions are updated and replaced by Amendment 116. And Amendment 154 removes a reference to amending the MPF which uh, the Bill would place in Section 3D of the 1997 Act uh, which is repealed by Amendment 115 on the purpose of planning. Turning to Amendment 41 in the name of Graham Simpson, uh, my Amendment 116 already sets out detailed proposals uh, for handling the consideration of substantial and minimal amendments to the National Planning Framework. My amendment also provides clarity on, con on consultation and reporting requirements for amendments reflecting the commitment I made at Stage 1. Um, as a result, I do not support Amendment 41 and would ask Graham Simpson not to move it. I also do not support Amendment 116H in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, we have already proposed a radical change to the MPF by giving the Scottish Parliament the power to approve the proposed framework before it can be adopted. This is a significant shift in the balance of power and responsibility for the National Planning Framework, which I hope that the Committee welcomes. Amendment 116H does not require the Parliament to state why they consider that the NPF should be amended or in what way, but I assume Mr Cole, Hamil Mr. Cole Hamilton intends that the resolution should set these things out. 
However, the MPF is a statement of the Scottish Minister's policies and priorities for the development and use of land. The role of Parliament should be to scrutinise the government policies, including making suggestions for changes where appropriate, but it should not have the ability to instruct ministers to amend the MPF in particular ways. Very briefly. Thank you. Thank the Minister for giving way. I think the, the purpose for my amendment is recognising that uh, things come up and uh, sometimes the planning cycle does not um, give ground or flexibility where uh, a shock to the system requiring you know, a, a massive change to housing policy uh, is forthcoming. And, and therefore, I think we do need a mechanism for Parliament to trigger that. Um, I, I think that, as I have already stated, we have changed uh, already um, the way that we are doing these things. Um, I think that Parliament has got a lot of ways of, of dealings with shocks to the system and we'll have to become uh, adaptable um, in many areas uh, what with uh, the forthcoming uh, chaos that may come from uh, Brexit. Um, my concerns about uh, Mr Cole Hamilton's uh, amendments are also practical. Uh, Bringing forward an amendment to the MPF would be a significant undertaking given the rigorous process we are now proposing and it would be difficult to ensure that the time and resources required to follow Parliament's ins instruction to amend the MPF would be available at any given time. I ask the committee to agree amendments 128 and 154 in addition to amendment 116 which sets a clear and proportionate approach for amending the national planning framework and I ask that you reject amendments 41 and 116H please convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham Simpson to speak to Amendment 41 and other amendments in the group. Um, just Amendment 41, uh, Convener. Um, the, the Minister's touched on it already. Uh, it mainly ensures that Ministers are required to say when an amendment to the MPF would be significant enough to require the plan to be revised. So this again is all about uh, parliamentary scrutiny, in fact enhanced parliamentary scrutiny. Uh, and uh, I will be moving it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as we've now completed the deba debate on the whole group, I call on Alec Cole Hamilton to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 185. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like specifically in my uh, winding up just to address the point that Andy Whiteman um, said. He expressed his view that uh, my amendment was not necessary, that actually this was really just tidying, tidying up the language of the 97 Act to reflect, reflect the new reality. In my experience, both before being elected and after being elected um, of parliamentary drafters and lawyers, is that they loathe unnecessary legislation. So um, whilst Andy may regard this as just tidying up, Legislators just don't do that. This is clearly to change intent, as far as I'm concerned, and, and that of my party. And that is that um, by so empowering ministers, or by stating the supremacy of ministerial policy in this regard, and tying it to the NPF rather than it being a vague notional direction for planning authorities, this sort of makes ministerial uh, policy and influence here, the alpha and the omega of the planning system. And as such, I restate my view and that of my council groups that this would be a gross centralisation of power and a relegation of local authority to the role of consultee in the planning process. And on that basis, um, I move, I press the amendment. Thank you very much. Um, He's pressing. Yep, yeah, yeah. Heard. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 185 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Can I ask those who are agreed to raise their hands, please? Thank you. Uh, those opposed? And there's therefore no abstentions. Thank you very much. Did you get that? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Disagreed. Yep. Uh, and My suggestion would be um, I'd stop there. Given that the, after this there's a huge block of, of voting which would take up a considerable amount of time, my suggestion is that we stop the voting here, we go on with some of the other pieces of business that we have to do today, which would give people uh, a chance to get a bite to eat before we start the early session this afternoon, because we will not get through all the voting before we have to break off today. Uh, and then what we do is we just reconvene the voting next week. Yes, go.
I'd, I'd quite like to do the voting while it's fresh in our minds. Um, I don't know how long you think that's going to take. We might not be able to get it all finished in time. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy to carry on if that's with the, if that's with the wishes of the committees. We'll go on and we'll do as much of it as we can. Okay. But just none of you come, come complaining to me this afternoon that you're starving. That's the only thing I would say. Right. Okay. And in that case, then I call Amendment 30 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 185. Graham Simpson, to move or not to move? Um, I'm going to move. You're going to move. The question, therefore, is uh, Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Okay. Those who are in agreement, raise your hands, please. And those opposed? It's agreed. Four to three, no abstentions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I call Amendment 104 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 185. Monica Lennon, to move or not move? Move. Move. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 104 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Okay, those who are agreed. Thank you. Okay, those opposed. Okay, yes. and no abstentions. Agreed to. Yes, agreed to. Four to three. Uh, I call Amendment 167 in the name of Kenneth Gibson, already debated with Amendment 185. Kenneth Gibson, to move or not to move? Moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 167 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Don't be so keen, please. Uh, will those who are in favour raise their hands? OK, and those who are opposed? Can we just pause there for a second? Yep. And no abstentions. So that's agreed to. OK. Therefore... Therefore, it's been agreed, 5-2. Okay. I call Amendment 31 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 185. Graham, to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh, yes. Those who are in favour? Those who are opposed? Okay, four three agreed. Four three. Stop for a second. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I call amendment two one one in the name of Rhoda Grant. Already debated with amendment one eight five. Rhoda Grant to move or not move? Move. Okay. The question therefore is that amendment two one one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Okay, those who are in favour? Those who are opposed? Okay, that's agreed. 4 3. I call Amendment 83 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 185. Andy Whiteman, to move or not move? Move. Thank you. And I call Amendment 83A in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 185. Yes. Thank you. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 83A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Right, OK. Uh, those who are in agreement, please raise their hand. Those who are opposed, it's agreed 5 2. Stop for a second. Yep. Okay. Andy Whiteman, to press or withdraw Amendment 83? Press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 83 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Okay. Uh, therefore, those who are in favour, please, please. And those who are opposed. Uh, and it falls 5 to 2. No abstentions. Okay. I call Amendment 160 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 185. John Finney is not here. You move on his behalf, Andy. I'd like to move. Yeah, absolutely. The question is that Amendment 160 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Okay, those who are in agreement and those who are opposed. 
four three. Okay. Uh, therefore, it passes. It's agreed four three. I call Amendment 168 in the name of Kenneth Gibson, already debated with Amendment 185. Kenneth Gibson to move or Moved. not move? Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 168 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yep. Yes. Those who are agreed? Those who are opposed? It's therefore agreed to 5-2. Yep. Okay. I call Amendment 215 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 185. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. Yes. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 215 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Those who are in favour, please raise your hands. Those who are opposed? The amendment falls. 4-3. Okay. I call Amendment 212 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 185. Rhoda Grant to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Uh, the member wishes to withdraw their amendment. It's okay, she's not moved. That's good, I'm delighted to hear it. Uh, I call Amendment 213 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 185. Rhoda to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 214 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 185. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? To move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 214 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Motion there has been passed. 7-0. I call Amendment 186 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 185. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 186 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Those who are in favour, please raise your hands. And those who are opposed? It's 5 to in favour. Yeah, yeah. I call Amendment 169 in the name of Kenneth Gibson. Already debated with Amendment 185. Kenneth Gibson to move or Moved. not move? The question is that Amendment 169 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, those who are in favour, please raise your hands. And those who are opposed. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. It's agreed 5-2. Call Amendment 216 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 185. Rhoda Grant to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 187 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 185. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question therefore is that Amendment 187 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Uh, those in favour? And those opposed? Okay, 187 is agreed to, 4 to 3. Okay. Yeah. I call Amendment 71 in the name of Claire Baker, already debated with Amendment 185. Claire Baker to move or not move? It moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 71 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Therefore, the amendment is passed. I call Amendment 72 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 185. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment... Sorry, the, the amendment is agreed to. I call Amendment 32 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 185. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, those in favour of Amendment 32, please raise your hands. Okay, and those opposed? The amendment passes 4 to 3. Okay. 
I call Amendment 33 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 185. Uh, Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh, yes. Right. Those in favour of Amendment 33? Okay. Uh, oh, those. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're arming your you're, you're arming your voice. We're doing two completely different things here. Uh, Can we just call, call that again. Yeah, okay, we'll call, we'll call that again then. Uh, call Amendment Thirty Three in the name of Graham Simpson. Graham's moved it. The question is, Amendment Thirty Three be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yeah. No. no. <laughs> right. Those in favour? Those opposed? That's forty-three in favour. The the amendment has been agreed to. Okay. I call Amendment 105 in the name of Monica Lennon. Already debated with Amendment 185. Monica Lennon to move, not move. 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 The question is that Amendment 105 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, the amendment is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 106 in the name of Monica Lennon. Already debated with Amendment 185. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. The, the question is that Amendment 106 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Will those who are in favour of the amendment please raise their hands? And those who oppose? The amendment 106 is agreed to 4 to 3. I call amendment 170 in the name of Kenneth Gibson, already debated with amendment 185. <coughs> Thank you. The question is that amendment 170 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There we go. The uh, amendment is therefore agreed to. Call Amendment 217 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 185. Rhoda Grant, to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 217 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Okay, those who are in favour of the amendment and those who are opposed. That's four. Yeah. Who is the You need to pay more attention, Mr Gibson. You, you need to pay more attention. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, I call Amendment 217 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment... Sorry, 218 in the name of Claudia Beamish. Already, that's your fault. <laughs> I call Amendment 218 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 185. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Just to, here to move, yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> The question is that Amendment 218 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the amendment has therefore been agreed to. I call Amendment 219 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 185. Monica Lennon? Moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 219 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Those who are in favour of 219, please raise your hand. Okay. Uh, it's four. And those opposed? Four, three. Uh, the two one nine is effort agreed to. Just suspend for a second. Yeah. Okay. Just, just suspend. Uh, I'm going to suspend the meeting for a second. Call Amendment 38 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 185. And I would point out that Amendments 38 and 39 are direct alternatives. This means that the committee can decide on both. If both are agreed to, Amendment 39 will replace Amendment 38. If either or both of these amendments are agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 6. It's preemption. Please note this direct alternative and preemption information as unfortunately it did not appear on the groupings. 
Therefore, Graham Simpson to move or not to move? Uh, uh, not moved, 38. Thank you. I call Amendment 39 in the name of Graham Simpson. Already debated with Amendment 185. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 39A in the name of Andy Whiteman. Already debated with Amendment 185. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 39A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those who are in favour of 39? And those who are opposed? OK, 39A has passed by four votes to three. I call Amendment 39B in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 185. Move. And, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, Right, the question is that Amendment 39B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Okay, uh, those in favour? Those who are opposed? That's 4 3 in favour, 39B. Uh, uh -huh. I now ask Graham Simpson to press or withdraw Amendment 39. Press. The question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. OK, those who are in favour and those opposed, the Amendment 39 has been agreed to 4 to 3. Go over the page. Amendment 40. Right, OK. I now call Amendment 40 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 185. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 40? Those opposed? If the amendment falls, four to three. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I call Amendment 116 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 184. Five. Minister, would you like to move formally? Formally moved, Minister. Thank you very much. Your amendments are slightly larger than anybody else's. Uh, I call amendments 116E in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated. Not moved. Thank you. Uh, I call Amendment 116A in the name of Kenneth Gibson, already debated. Moved. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 116A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, those in favour? Those opposed? Passes, the Amendment 116A passes 5 to 2. Okay. I call Amendment 1160 or O in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 185. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 1160 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. Okay. Well, those in favour, please show. And those opposed? Oh, I thought you were keeping that up there, Alex. Uh, it passes four to three. Okay. I call Amendment 116E in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's what? Next page, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. 116P in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 185. Monica Lennon to move or not move? The question is that Amendment 116P be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh, yes. No. Uh, those in favour? Those opposed? OK, uh, the Amendment 116P passes 4 to 3. Call Amendment 116B in the name of Kenny Gibson, already debated with Amendment 185. Moved. OK. The question is that 116B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, yes. Uh, those in favour? That's five. Those opposed? Two. Uh, the amendment passes. Yeah. OK. Right, I call Amendment 116F in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with that Amendment 185. Andy Whiteman to move or not? Moved. 
The question is that Amendment 116F be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. Okay, those in favour? Those opposed? That's two in favour, five opposed. The amendment falls. Okay, right. I call Amendment 116Q in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 185. Monica Lennon to move or not? Moved. The question is that Amendment 116Q be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no they, therefore, those in favour? And those opposed? It's three in favour, four opposed. Uh, amendment 116Q falls. I call Amendment 116R in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 185. Rhoda Grant to move or not? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 116R be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of uh, Amendment 116R? Four. Those opposed? Three. The Amendment 116R is passed. Call Amendment 116S in the name of Graham Simpson. Are we already debated with Amendment 185? Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 116S be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three, the Amendment 116S is agreed to. I call Amendment 116T in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 185. Rhoda Grant to move or not? Not moved. Thank you, Rhoda. I call Amendment 116U in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 185. Call Amendment 116V in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 185. Yeah, I wonder if that's... Yeah, OK. Uh, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 116V be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. OK. I call Amendment 116W in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 185. Rhoda Grant to move or not? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 116G in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 185. Andy Whiteman to move or not? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 116G be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, yes. Uh, those in favour? Those opposed? That's 5-2 in favour, and therefore Amendment 116G is agreed to. Yeah. Okay. I call Amendment 116H in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 185. Is anybody... Thank you, Andy. A, Andy Whiteman will move this on behalf of Alec Cole Hamilton. The question is, therefore, that Amendment 116H be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Did you say yes? No. no. I said no. Right. Nobody said yes then, no. That's good. Then. OK, those in favour? Those against? <laughs> uh, it's seven zero against. Uh, no luck, Alec. Uh, that amendment falls. Call amendment one one six N in the name of Monica Lennon. Already debated with amendment one eight five. Monica, move or moved. Not? Thank you. The question is that amendment one one six N be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Okay. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. The amendment one one six N is agreed to. I call Amendment 116X in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 185, and I remind members that if Amendment 116X is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 116C and 116I. Graham Simpson, the Simpson to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 116X be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh, yes. OK. Those... Those in favour? That four. Those opposed? Three. The amendment 116X is agreed to. Therefore, we'll go to 116. Page 45 for the page. Yep. I call amendment 116Y in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with amendment 185. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. 
The question is that Amendment 116Y be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? That's three. Those opposed? That's four. Then Amendment 116Y falls. I call Amendment 116J in the name of Monica Lennon. Already debated with Amendment 185. Monica Lennon to move on. Yes. The question is that Amendment 116J be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The, those in favour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't. Somebody wouldn't like it. The, right, OK, that's f five. <laughs> and those opposed, I was joking. <laughs> Uh, those opposed? Yeah, yeah. Right, OK. Yeah, that's all right. I'm quite happy to take my comments anyway. 5-2. Yes, 5-2. I call Amendment 116K in the name of Claire Baker, already debated with Amendment 185. Claire Baker to move or not move? Thank you. The question is that Amendment 116K be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, yes. Right. Therefore, Amendment 116K is agreed. I call Amendment 116Z in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 185. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 116Z be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. It's therefore passed. I call Amendment 116L in the name of Alistair Allen, already debated with Amendment 185. Alistair Allen to move or not? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 116L be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. Therefore, 116L has passed. I call am Amendment 116AA in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 185. Rhoda Grant to move or not? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 116AA be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Those in favour of 116A? That's four. Those opposed? That's three. Uh, therefore, 116A has passed. Double A has passed. I call Amendment 116AB in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 185. Monica Lennon to move or not? Move. The question is that Amendment 116AB be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Uh, therefore, Amendment 116AB is agreed to. I call Amendment 116AC in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 185. Monica Lennon to move or not? Move. The question is that Amendment 116AC be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, those in favour? And those opposed? That's 5 2 in favour, therefore the amendment passes. Yeah. Yeah. You okay, Jason? Yeah. I call Amendment 116AD in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 185. Graham Simpson to move or not move? The question is that Amendment 116AD be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of 116AD? That's four. Those opposed? That's three. 116AD is agreed to. I call Amendment 116D in the name of Kenneth Gibson, already debated with Amendment 185. Yes. Moved. The question is that Amendment 116D be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. That's therefore the 116 is agreed to. Call Amendment 116AE in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 185. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Andy? No? Oh, yeah, of course, Claire. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 116AE be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Congratulations. 116AE is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 116M in the name of Alistair Allen, already debated with Amendment 185. Alistair Allen to move or not move? Move. Uh, the question is that Amendment 116M be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. The... Okay, Minister, okay. Ready? Yep. Yep. Minister, would you like to press or withdraw Amendment 116? Uh, press, please, Commissioner. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 116 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. No. Okay. Uh, the, right. Uh, those in favour of 116? Those opposed to 116? 116 therefore falls. 43. The question is that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
Thank you very much. And can I say that that's a perfect example of completely ignoring the advice of the convener and getting through the, the <laughs> getting through the, the questions. Well done. Yes, yes. We'll suspend the meeting for uh, a couple of minutes to let the minister and the rest of the witnesses move.